Um, so we'll start with the uh, marijuana ordinance discussion. Mr. Bird and uh, Mr. Sapiens will be presenting. I think Mr. Bird has some things to hand out to us, um, but I'll hand it over to you. Um, we're passing out um, one of the, I think it was page six of the work session packet had a, a table that was a little small to read. So I printed it on 11 by 17 for you. Um, and included in this packet are also some uh, demonstrative maps showing some of the different um, concepts that were looked at in terms of um, setbacks for marijuana buffers. And we'll go over those here momentarily, but I want to make sure everyone's found. Dan, I want to thank you for making it big enough. <laughs> <laughs> it helps me too. <laughs> um, so we're here after uh, uh, there's been a lot of meetings to talk about marijuana and uh, potential options. You know, it started back in December. Um, staff came to the board with a proposal to uh, allow the board of adjustments to offer or to approve variances for the setbacks that are in the marijuana ordinance that was passed by the voters. Um, through discussions of that, uh, through a number of meetings, um, we got to our February 14th work session. And it was at that meeting that it seemed that the board will speak for the board, but we, we got some direction to, to look more holistically at the ordinance. And you know, rather than just changing one thing, uh, maybe look at a, a variety of options that can meet the goals of the town with regard to marijuana. At that meeting, caps on marijuana stores were discussed. I think there were a lot of administrative issues and it seemed the board didn't favor that approach. They wanted us to come back with uh, a variety of proposals or some proposals which we put together here. Um, we are in the options before you, we're moving away from that proposal to allow the Board of Adjustments to approve variances um, and making those binding on the local licensing authority. You know, that option was really there because we needed, we felt we needed some procedure, we needed some process. Um, I think it would create some clarity, but it would, in some ways, um, because it allows another board to vary the setbacks, it maybe reduces the amount of clarity for others in the town. Um, we think there are better ways. Uh, we think there are more uh, direct approaches, more intentional <laughs> decisions that the board can make and the town can make about um, how marijuana might operate in the town of Wellington to, to, to implement the ordinance from 2021. Uh, and through all those meetings and after that February 14th meeting, you know, Cody and I have talked about this a lot. Um, over that time, and that's how we got here today. Um, let me check my notes. We wanted Cody to put together a variety of options and, and kind of give you the menu of choices that are available. In past discussions, it's been really we've been talking about a single policy approach, um, and instead, we thought it'd be better to give you the whole range and it's, demonstrate how that could even put together. Um, and that's where Cody comes in with his planning expertise. And, uh, Thanks, Dan. Um, the other piece too I don't want to overlook was the considerations that were underway um, as part of a broader effort to update the zoning map for the town um, that started over a year ago. Um, and that included some of the transitional properties that were previously commercial. Some of them got rezoned to C3, others were rezoned to residential, which influenced the buffer setback distances as well as some considerations around the P public zone district properties and how that was applied um, consistently throughout town. The zoning map has been adopted as you all know, um, and that allowed us to provide a better level of clarity instead of guessing at some of those buffer boundaries and what changes to those dis or buffer distances might look like. We've been able to, to provide some more context on the exam example maps here that clearly illustrate our current zone. Um, so the, as Dan alluded to, um, when I look at, at this scenario, we're definitely trying to uh, honor the intent of the board, the intent of the voter, voters um, in applying setback buffers and distances. Um, but what I was really hearing at the meetings was we're, we're looking for, for some different option other than just a singular change. And so what I tried to do was go through and think of what are the different tools in the toolbox um, that we have available that we can use, what can we change, and what would the reasonable expectations of those, cha of those changes look like. And so I tried to consolidate that into a very text-heavy table 
Um, I apologize. I apologize for that, but it got down to one page. Um, it's so good. It's yeah. I, I, it's intended to provide just an objective. These are the things that we can think about. Um, and my initial planning considerations for what would we expect that to, to do. Um, and then we, we put some examples together based on those strategies I call them in the staff report. So referring to page six of the packet, um, the, I kind of grouped these into categories. One of the tools that we, that we have that we probably need to do is create some clarity on a couple of the topics that were discussed by the board. A lot of that work I think has really been done. Um, it hasn't been adopted, we've been sort of talked about it, um, uh, including the neighborhood need, uh, needs and desires and the hearing process for the licensing authority, um, creating some clarity um, around um, the zoning, making sure that the R3 is included. When, when the voters were referred to the ordinance um, a number of years ago, um, the R3 category wasn't currently in use and it didn't make it in that ordinance and now we're using it so it needs to be included to honor that intent for all residential categories. Um, and we also heard um, that the um, one of the applicants or a couple of the applicants have presented your definition for schools isn't very clear. Um, I think we need to clarify that definition one way or the other on the topic of home daycares and whether those are included or not included. Um, the way staff has interpreted it is the language says any licensed daycare. Um, and that in our minds is clear that that includes in that or is included in that definition with the 2000 foot buffer currently. Um, others have argued that that's not the case. I think we need to provide some clarity and I've presented a couple of options for how that clarity could be provided. Um, the next tool in the toolbox, we can reduce setbacks. That was recommended by a number of applicants. It was discussed by the board. Um, maybe even some, some uh, um, preference shown to, can we reduce a setback that would provide additional flexibility so we don't have a singular user in town where it's been pretty well vetted through our uh, number of applicants that we don't have a, another location currently that would meet all of the setback requirements. We understood from the board, maybe there's a desire to, uh, provide some additional flexibility. And next as a planner, I thought to myself, well, if we reduce a setback to provide more flexibility, that could open up a broader area more than was intended. So how do we get back to limiting the number of total licenses in town? And my suggestion is, well, we can also increase a setback or multiple setbacks to make sure that the distributed uh, coverage of those different application types are still commensurate, commensurate with the size of our community, um, but using the setbacks to achieve that instead of setting a cap or a limit that would create a, a complicated lottery system and a lot of, of um, unfairness to, to our applicants and our residents. Um, so we provided a couple of different options for ways we can increase um, the different setbacks as different kind of levers in the toolbox that we can pull. Um, we also I included a couple of other things in here that we heard. And I tried to vet those and, and provide some planning context to whether those work or don't work and not with any recommendations, um, tried to present what those options were. Um, we heard from some of the applicants, um, why don't you include additional zone districts where um, marijuana retail stores are an allowed use and some different ideas on what that might look like. That's obviously a tool the board could consider. We haven't really heard that direction, but we wanted to include it to be completely objective. Um, as well as if you keep it where C3 is the only zone district where it's allowed, which is your current rule. Um, and changing of the zoning for the, the P public districts, um, I, in my opinion, that has largely been vetted and accomplished in the zone map updates to where additional action wouldn't be necessary. Um, but we threw it on here because it was certainly discussed and we didn't want to leave something out. Um, we mentioned the CAPS, which was a tool that we think the board has moved past. Um, and then I threw out another option of we understood that the intent of the, the board was to um, not put words in mouths, but we kind of understood that there was a desire to keep um, marijuana retail stores located somewhat close proximity to I-25 corridor, um, maybe not all through town, but where we're expecting um, traffic from other communities to come here to avail themselves of those, those retail establishments. Maybe we don't want that traffic driving down local roads. Let's keep it close to the highway. One of the tools we could use is in addition to your current buffers and um, setback distances, could also require a maximum distance away from the highway uh, for those establishments. Um, so those, these are kind of tools in the toolbox. There are other planning tools out there 
that I thought about and didn't include on this list simply because they're quite a bit bigger task. Um, and I, I'm certainly happy to go into those, but I didn't provide the context in this report because there are a lot more steps than the board could take on in one meeting. So we tried to keep it kind of condensed to the things that have been talked about, discussed, and thrown out. Basically, you can use any combination of these things to achieve the board's desired effect. And before Cody gets into kind of the various options, kind of some packages of these different tools, um, I wanted to discuss uh, some issues I've found recently with regard to in-home daycares. Um, as Cody mentioned, there have been some uh, interpretations of our, our code that in-home daycares may or may not be covered by it. The definition of school that's in our code, and that's uh, it's a 2,000 foot setback from schools. Our marijuana ordinance that was adopted defines a school as a public or private preschool, including licensed daycares, elementary schools, middle schools, et cetera. And there is an argument out there that uh, because it's schools, including public and private preschools and in-home daycare wouldn't be considered a school. It is a licensed daycare, but it is not a school. You know, I, I'm not sure I, that holds a ton of water. Um, it certainly is not our interpretation of that, of that section. However, I think there are some real practical impacts of this that I, I want to bring to your attention. Um, one is that in-home daycares are not licensed by the town of Wellington. Um, this means that the town is not involved in an in-home daycare being set up. Um, for practical purposes, this means a applicant for a marijuana dispensary could go to the town, come to the town of Wellington, ask for a uh, zoning and setback approval. Uh, the planning director could work with that applicant, review the location, sign off, and say there is no daycare anywhere within uh, the 2,000 feet of that. That applicant can then continue with their application, submitting all the paperwork to the state, submitting all the paperwork to the town, going through all of that. Um, and then discover the day before the uh, hearing before the local licensing authority that an in-home daycare opened. Um, the town, of course, wouldn't know this. The town wouldn't have anything to do with it. Um, that, but that's a lot of uncertainty for a business to go through that process. Applying for a marijuana license is minimum thousands of dollars of application fees that go to the state and go to the town. Um, but we couldn't even give them heads up um, that that might be the case because simply we don't know. The only tool that's in the town's at our disposal to know about in-home daycares, and that's a, a technical term in the state is a family child care home, mm -hmm. is that right? Um, is a website that's operated by the state called Colorado Shines. Um, Colorado Shines, we have contacted them, we've talked to them a number of times to make sure that it is up to date, because we need to know that it's actually accurate if we're making decisions about where a business can be located, both that if an app uh, a license is given for an in-home daycare, it shows up there. And if a license is surrendered or terminated, that it's removed from that so that we have accurate, up-to-date information. Um, but that website is, to put it mildly, not great. Um, just in my most recent experience, I was looking for, um, I was looking to see where in-home daycares were in town. And so I went to the website and I like to think that I'm a pretty technologically set person. Um, and I typed in Wellington, Colorado and all daycares within all licensed um, childcare facilities of any kind within one mile. That's it, Wellington, Colorado, one mile. 11 licenses came up. I know there's more than that. <laughs> um, there's actually 17 licenses in the town of Wellington. So you actually have to say Wellington within five miles. But even if you say that, it's not good. Um, I, I actually had a lot of trouble finding licensed daycare centers on that site that I knew existed. Um, and the problem that I'm, I have with that, after uh, since I had trouble, I know others might. The problem, real problem I have is, while Cody is very familiar with that site and can find them, um, if he's not in the office, if somebody submits that form to us um, and they don't know all the tricks of this rather poorly designed website. Um, what happens if a deputy in Cody's office signs that verification form using the site and provides wrong information? Now we've told an applicant, move forward, go finish your application, spend those thousands of dollars to the town of Wellington, to the state, fill out all the forms, jump through all the hoops. And then we come back and go, oh, we, we, we looked at the website wrong. But it also happens the other way, where applicants come to the town and spend a lot of Cody's time filling in, asking for verifications 
for their site. And they say, I went to the website, there's absolutely nothing. And Cody said, oh, you, you didn't you didn't click on the, the this and the that. Here's the, here's the daycare within 2000 feet. So applicants, it, it's actually really challenging for accurate applicants to know whether they can open a shop. I'm more concerned with the fact that it's also challenging for the town to accurately determine where these shops are. And that's because we have, we just have nothing to do with it. We don't license them at all. Um, they can open at any time without notice to the town, without any information coming to us. Um, commercial daycares are, are certainly different. A commercial child care center or preschool is where the town is involved in a lot more. So it doesn't just happen overnight, but for the town and for applicants, really family child care homes can open overnight. In the middle of a process, uh, it's really hard to track. So uh, that's just kind of a recent experience for us. It's, it's a real challenge of that. Uh, so I want to <coughs> highlight that issue that I've experienced. Do, <coughs> do we know how quick the turnaround time is of them inputting a new daycare or taking out a... That's one thing that we, before, when we were looking at this about how to implement it, so Cody and I actually, we, we have talked to the folks that, uh, that operate Colorado Shine too well. If a license is uh, approved at the state, how long before it's entered in? And it's within hours. I mean, it, it is actually a very, very up-to-date page. The information that goes in is great. It's just hard to gather. It sometimes can be a bit of a challenge to gather that. <coughs> so, in addition to the, the challenges with using that website as a tool and relying upon it, um, and the uncertainties that it creates, I'd also throw out there too. This is one of my planner thoughts was when we're writing legislation for the town, applying that a buffer or setback to a target that could move, um, and you know, home daycare could open, that could close, it could open a day after someone submitted their application, I'm reviewing it day two, and that information is there suddenly where it wasn't the day they applied. And it just creates uncertainty. And from a legislative standpoint, that we're writing a set of rules that everyone in town has to apply to, Residents don't know whether that daycare is going to stay and if they're within that 2,000 foot buffer at their home and rely upon that. Applicants don't know if there's a change. Town staff doesn't know when there's a change. It's, it's very hard to be predictable in writing a set of legislations when the target moves around or can come and go. Um, and so I, I feel that there's an element there, not only from the practicality of using the tools available to us, but also in writing legislation for how those rules should be implemented throughout town isn't going to be consistent for, for any given length of time. Um, and that's a concern of mine from the enforcement of those rules. Our at home licensed, at home daycare is required to have a business license in the town of Wellington? The, a home daycare is required to have a home occupation license, but not ever there's no trigger at the state level to say oh don't forget to get your home occupation license no a licensed one not an at home but a license at home daycare i don't think there's a significant difference between those two terms um the state defines a lot of different levels of what is a home daycare and and i, I won't dive into all the, the nuanced <laughs> details of that but a licensed child care facility would be a home occupation that has to obtain a, a town home occupation permit um, there are some other categories in the state that don't require licenses if you're watching two or fewer and they're a family friend or something. There's a couple of different categories there. Um, but the home occupation is difficult for us to enforce because the state removed the preempted local legislation over anything that involves a home daycare. We can't treat them any differently than any other uh, residential use. And so there's not really a good trigger for us to know when a home daycare has been licensed unless we happen to find it or they happen to come in for that home occupation permit. It's a pretty difficult thing for us to know when that changes. So question is part of their licensing process with the state, do they have to show that they have that home? They do not have to show the state that they've gotten that. Correct. Right. Okay. And, and as Cody mentioned, the state doesn't remind them either. Okay. It's, it's, so the state doesn't care. The state no. doesn't care. Got it. <laughs> Cody, I have a quick question for you. Wasn't there also some recent legislative changes to business licenses in general that retracted them to where if uh, they weren't required anymore? if they're they're doing business in town but they're not physically located in town so that could make using business licenses as a requirement in general for trying to i don't know track these things not super accurate 
And so yeah, we're using the, you're correct on the business license piece, but we would require them, a home daycare would have the home occupation license. So two separate, two separate items. And since the state doesn't make it a requirement, we have no way of tracking it. So is there any way we can get them to register? Uh, because the state has basically preempted all. Well, I know they do, but I mean, for our records, can we make that kind of one of the pre requirements for that? They don't they, need it. They, I know they don't need to, but I mean, if we put in there, if they need to register to possibly be used for these standards here, maybe these people would register at well, that point. I think one of the challenges that in home daycares have currently is like they were mentioning, there's a tons of fees and classes and all kinds of things that mm -hmm. they have to try and do to open up a business or mm -hmm. community. And if they, like somebody is moving here, let's say from Fort Collins or Loveland or whatever, and trying to open up their daycare here, I mean, that could potentially discourage them if we're continually adding on additional licensing requirements for all of these businesses. Well, I mean, on this one here, if we could just have one of the things that the town would like them to do would be register and that way we can use that for factoring in this type of a guidance here well the town I already mean, wants that right what the town already wants that we, i we, would think they would, would but i mean you must not have made it real knowledgeable that that is something that we would like to have but it's, the the challenge is not so much the that we make it a requirement that we don't it, the challenge is that we don't know who the operators are to contact them to tell them that this is a requirement and they may not know it because they're not looking for that. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing we hear in my department all the time. I didn't know I needed a building permit for that one. Okay. So right now we got what, 10, you said, registered? There are 17, license. 17 licenses. But 17, but we have 10 that we know about, right? Mm -hmm. No, there, no, there's 17. I mean, uh, what do in one search on the website it comes up with 11 with with another search it comes up with okay so so we actually know what they are and where they're at we think so okay and if they haven't registered and if we don't know we can't use that particular data anyway correct i would think it, to be a daycare they need to be licensed right and that's through the state through the state right but uh, having a local license doesn't mean that they're licensed through the state and having a it, it's challenging to track is right. what we're trying to say. And, and, and the challenge, not only to, to track, but also to, we don't know that there's one out there if they don't register with right. us. How do we know when they open if they don't contact right. us? And maybe in the wording in what we have in the marijuana requirement, have a registered license so that we at least got some type of a guideline to go by. And if they don't register, we can't use it. So you're saying that to have, they must have a local business license, right? Or at least register that you have business or that you are licensed, just so we know what our guidelines are. I, I know it could be a pain, but then it throws the burden back on the daycares if they were wanting to be used in this calculation, and if they don't use. If they don't register, they're not going to be used in the calculation to determine whether the marijuana license are adequate for that area. And they can't come back and say, hey, we're here. I, See? I, I think I kind of follow what you're saying, trustee. And I, I wonder too, one of the thoughts that's coming to my mind is again, the, the consistency piece. Mm -hmm. if, if we're writing legislation, is that going to be a consistent standard that can be relied upon by everyone in the community? to know which ones are registered or not registered. Mm -hmm. And if they don't register and we don't use it, how is everyone supposed to know? Is it creating a consistent, predictable environment mm -hmm. to operate within? And yeah. I, I think there'd be some challenges with that. Yeah. But I, I, I would like to move on to the, the okay. marijuana options. So trustee Daly, Senator, hand up for Just a couple of things on daycares. Yeah. Okay, the first one yeah. is in-home daycares are, home occupations in that they're businesses that are intended to operate within a residential zone. So that's the purpose of them. They live within residential. Um, so the nature of these businesses are very significantly different than a commercial preschool, like a Creative Kids Corner, which is like a commercial mm -hmm. business and like a school, Rice, Ice Stone, Wellington Middle High School. An in-home daycare is a completely different operation. And the purpose of it operating within a residential district is that it's it's intended to be able to operate within and not disrupt residential properties, right? So in my mind, 
I don't think that these are related completely. I don't think it's one for one. I don't think it's in-home daycare equals Rice Elementary School. I don't think um, that's how it's supposed to be supposed to operate. It is supposed to operate within residential. So anything that applies to residential should indeed, for every other standing, for any other purpose, would apply to in-home daycare. So I do want to point that out. So I, I'm not quite sure if the in-home daycare should maybe classify or be considered as a residential setback. Because in my mind, that's why it's supposed to be operating within a residential district. So that was one. Two, we received a ton of public comment regarding um, the concern of daycares being included within uh, private or private preschools. Um, a lot of people were under the impression originally that that was there. And that was kind of something that changed when we were doing negotiations, of course, for the wording of it. And that was something that was added, I think, for the purpose of being able to very clearly define. Um, so, I know there's a lot of public comment, a ton that's come before us in meetings of concerns of why that was included and why that's part of it. So that's the other thing. We've heard a lot of public opinion. Three, we're showing it's really hard to do business in Wellington. It's incredibly risky. You can invest, you can buy property, you can do licensing, and it might just be pulled away from you without anybody's knowledge or, or concern. Um, that's not how I want businesses to approach Wellington. If they're coming and they're saying, I wanna invest in your community, and we said, let us help you. Oh, sorry, I know you've done thousands of dollars. You bought a million dollar property, too bad now. Um, based on a thing that we can't clearly define or provide certainty around in-home daycares, man, that makes Wellington look really bad for business. And if I were somebody who's trying to invest millions of dollars, I wouldn't feel comfortable to even approach that. And I don't think that's the reputation I want Wellington to have. So that really scares me. And we've acknowledged that that's come up already. Um, and I already mentioned the schools are very different from in-home daycares. So I think we should really consider how in-home daycares play and really where it should be classified within which one of these setbacks. I mean, their business is intended to operate in residential zones. So I think that residential that setback should likely apply. If that should be a larger setback, I don't know, but, but I just wanted to acknowledge that. Those are my three points. So I think that my, I understand the challenges that staff has to go through and the applicants have to go through. I think for me, it comes down to what is the purpose of having a 2000 foot setback from the schools? Is it because there's all this stuff going on at schools? Is it because, no, it's because we don't want our children in close proximity to that that's the reasoning behind that and so regardless of whether it operates in the exact same manner as a school or commercial daycare i think the idea behind it is it's to keep our children safe and so if we're looking at it from that perspective because yes children live in residential they will go into commercial but most of our children spend the majority of their day in a school or in a daycare that's just that, that's what we live in and so that is where they spend a the majority of their time and so while I understand the challenges, I don't think that we should say, oh, it's too hard. Therefore, these children of ours that aren't in a commercial preschool or they're not in a public school should not have the same protections we're giving to others. So I think from that perspective, when I look at it, the point behind that is we're saying, hey, we feel this is a setback that needs to be there to protect our kids. And yes, I understand that the challenges for us, that's part of how the world works, right? We as adults have to do things to make sure that our children are protected. My life is a lot harder than my children's life because there are things I do for them to make sure they're protected that they never know about. Um, so I understand there are challenges. It does make life harder for us and our partners in the community, but I think that that should be something that we're all willing to say that, hey, this is something our children are worth protecting. Cody, I have a question for you. This map on top right here that lists the school 2000 foot buffer, zone P 500 foot buffer, this one right here, is this the one we're looking at with the ordinance as is? Um, yes, and we might want to jump into those maps so I can kind of orient you with what we're showing. Yes. But in, in short, the, the one that you're holding up has the 2,000 foot for schools, 500 foot for public districts, and 200 foot for residential. Shows your current regulation, except it doesn't have the current 500 foot buffer around um, existing marijuana approved licenses. I have a separate map for that I'll reference. Um, 
And there was another caveat I was going to throw out there. Let me jump into the maps because I think we'll come out and orienting you with what we present. Got it. I had one additional question on that. Sure. So from my counting here, I'm looking at five available spots to open up a shop for marijuana. Just from what I'm looking at at this map right now. Well, I'm, let's let's maybe dive into the maps yeah. um, because I think the other oh the other the other thing I was going to mention this doesn't include any buffers around any of the in-home daycares which takes up a very large area we didn't map every single one of those because they continue to change and we want to make sure we're presenting you information you can rely on um, so in the if if you kept your maps in order that's how I was I put them in specific <laughs> order I don't go through them. Um, the one on top, it's labeled 2,000 foot school buffer. That shows you the, um, the current uh, buffer distances with the 2,000 foot from schools. Again, it doesn't include the, the existing approved license locations. It doesn't, improve in it doesn't include in-home daycares. The next map shows you, we took that same base layer for public and public districts and residential districts, and we, we heard potentially reduce the school the separation from schools and we threw out 1500 feet we we'll just use round numbers we used 2000 existing we threw out 1500 so you can see what that would look like the one the very next map is a thousand feet um, so that's the only change in those three maps was the school separation from 2000 to 1500 to 1000 and again this is just intended to illustrate the kind of order of magnitude for what those changes would look like the board can choose mm -hmm. 1700 feet or 750 feet, whatever the right number is, we're just trying to show you the relative impact. The next map, the fourth map, it's labeled 7846 Street, 500 foot buffer. That is showing the existing approved license location along 6th Street, just south of the hotel. And it's showing the 500 foot setback that's currently in your regulations. The next one is the same map that's showing a thousand feet buffer around that same location. The reason we showed that was again, looking at all the tools in the toolbox, if one uh, se our separation buffer was, was decreased, it might be proven to increase another one so that we don't have proliferation um, all in the same neighborhood of, of a whole handful of, of the same types of license applications. Um, so increasing the setback distance around the, the retail stores was one of the strategies. The next map is labeled base map. Um, this top base map is showing just your, your uh, public zone district buffers and your residential buffers at the existing distances. The next one is the same map, but it's showing um, increases of the residential buffer from 200 to 250 and the public zone district buffer from 500 to 1,000. Again, the intention there being we're trying to illustrate if one setback distance is reduced that allows greater flexibility, it can be offset by providing increases in others. So increasing the residential buffer to protect those in-home daycares under the residential umbrella, uh, playgrounds and schools and public facilities, increase that separation instead of the 500 feet, maybe it's a thousand where there's greater separation uh, from a, a marijuana retail store. Um, and then the last map, um, this one we put together, this, this shows the option C combination that was included as one of the possible options in your, in your staff memo. Um, this, this last map kind of tried to put everything together just to illustrate what could be one of the potential outcomes. It's showing the um, 1500 foot um, distance from schools, um, showing 1000 feet from public properties, 250 feet from residential properties. It shows the thousand feet separation from a, a, the only approved uh, marijuana licensed store here in town. Um, and this one again does not include any buffers for the in-home daycares. That was more than we were able to show for demonstrative purposes. So any questions on the example only maps um, that we've included in the packet tonight? It is yes. very difficult <laughs> to understand the, the true impact that we're having on an ability for something to open up without having the already licensed child care facilities on a map. 
So, because from what I see here with what's presented, I see five locations, but I don't see which if map, those are limited. Which the, map the, how the ordinance is written now. So I see five possibilities. Also, possibilities to zone in land that is currently for sale. But so, how I look at it now, it doesn't demonstrate that we're putting any difficulty on anyone to get a license. So, it would be super beneficial to know where all of those restrictions lie. Because as it sits right now, it can't use the business, or it's, it's difficult for them to open as an excuse when. I can see multiple locations that they can open. I'm curious of what those locations might be because are you also taking into consideration that it's from C3? So one, you can look at far left of your map over by Glove Flower and Buttercup. Mm -hmm. You can look at the Speedies Vita, I'm pronouncing Sorry. that. Yes, so, so that one is where our current one application is already. If you look at off Cleveland, the right side of Cleveland, um, just past the railroad tracks, that's not zoned that, but it can get, they can put in a variance to have a zoning change, correct? You can um, submit a variance for a zoning change. Not variance, a zoning. A, a rezone application right. can be submitted for any property. So, and then you go over to Piper Way. And there's a location over there, it's industrial, but you can submit again for that rezone and that goes before whom? The planning commission or board of adjustments? Everybody. The planning Not commission and board of trustees. trustees. Okay. So the only thing I challenge that for is that we are looking for like actual potential locations. I don't think we could consider because it is an offsetting for a rezone to be approved. I mean, if we're looking at this map as this is the setbacks from what's available and current right now, mm -hmm. I don't think we could consider anything unless in one of these categories where we're saying we're going to permit it in other zones that we could say that those are viable locations because they aren't under the ordinance for it because it's required to be secret. I right. mean, if you guys want to talk yeah, about we have to look at the information zone, in front of us yeah. and make our decision based off of that. Yeah, because there's so much involved in that. I would throw out there too that, that most applicants and staff certainly I think the public would reasonably expect that if it's not currently identified on the zoning map as C3 public and it's not going to be allowed obviously the, the planning commission would make a recommendation and the board of trustees would make a decision on a potential rezone I don't think you it's not typical to base your assumptions on what will be allowed on a property that it's going to be rezoned to something different. It's always an option, but I don't think most people expect that it will change. A lot of those have failed in the past. What well, we've been arguing. Yeah. And to trustee teaches point, I mean Piper, that that is not in character of what C3 is, right? C3 is frontage road corridor property right so the, something that's c3 up on the north side of town that doesn't make any sense right that's right. not within the character of what c3 is so i have a question if we they did it way up on that north end of piper when that you know kind of defeat the point that uh, mr bird made about you know limiting the transit through town like that would you know take people right right past the schools and then right up into that that area i mean if we try and keep it like along that I-25 corridor in those where the C3 is intended to be, I think that that, you know, addresses that concern of trying to keep that traffic in a, in a specific place on town. And this comes from our town with that too. I mean, within the ordinance, there is requested setback or, you know, there are setbacks from, you know, one location to another. And I, my interpretation of that is, there was not a desire to have multiple shops near each other, in which case limiting it to a very specific corridor is really kind of going against that. So, I mean, as much as traffic wise, I feel like that makes sense. I feel like the voters likely did that with the idea that they couldn't be right next to each other or the idea that they wouldn't be like, here's our marijuana district, you know? So I, I feel like the intention was to spread them out. Um, 
the one across town. Yeah, well, I don't know, but but I just well, I like how staff included options for defining that through those marijuana buffers. I think that that was a great way to try yeah. and address because I mean, it's the same thing with like liquor stores and pawn shops, mm -hmm. right? right? We don't want a whole chain We're of them right next to each other, yeah, mm -hmm. but we do have to be reasonable about a distance, you know, in between. I agree. And then we have to keep in mind that the in-home daycares are not included in that because those are kind of uncertain. So even if we are seeing locations that are C3 that are excluded from the, the setbacks, there likely or could be an in-home daycare that would impact that. So when we're saying there's so many sites available, that's likely not the case if we're considering in-home daycares at C3. But we also just identified that we're not supposed to assume that. I, I think that's the decision we have to make because it, it explicitly says in home daycares are included at schools currently. It's just like, it says license, like, license, daycares. license, license, license daycares. Mm -hmm. so it's in home daycare. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, I mean, and I would agree that that needs to be defined. I, I would feel they are, yes, it's a different type of daycare. There are differences in it, but I think that, that we, regardless of whether we decide to remove that or not, it, if it stays in, that does need to be clearly defined. So it's just, there's no question on that. So I'm going to say I would like to see it stay in, but identify licensed. That's kind of. Yeah. I would like to see the well, first license, option no. that we had. I like that. You know, you're talking about the keeping it close to the interstate. Right now, we got such a cluster up there on the interstate anyway coming in. So, you know, we're really don't know what kind of impact this is all going to have on our city right now whether it's traffic whether it's crime whatever else you know i think we need to go slow we can always change this down the road from this if we see we need to open it up a little bit more you said it was a breathing document that we got that we can change but i don't think we should just open up everything right now until we see the effects of what it's going to have on our community and whether it's good or bad, you know, if it's a fantastic effect that they bring to it, then we can open it up for more. But I think we need to move slow. I know like Fort Collins, right now they have actually limited, I think they got a cap and a moratorium on more marijuana places coming into town. So do we want to be their outlet now or, or what? Or do we want to do it and do it smart? Uh, so we don't have the negative impacts that uh, Fort Collins is now experiencing from a lot of it. So I don't know. I think we need to move slower. And, you know, we need, I can see want to be business friendly, mm -hmm. but only to a certain extent. I really worry about being like super pro business, except for if you're this business. So well, I really am concerned. This about is a different business than a lot of them. I mean, we've got to be honest about that. And, uh, you know, maybe marijuana itself is not that bad, but some of the things that come along with it aren't necessarily good either. I mean, again, Portland, Oregon is a good example. You know, marijuana, marijuana may not be a bad product there, but all the stuff that's came along with it has pretty much destroyed that city. So, I mean, again, we, I think we need to uh, be very cognizant of that and move slow and we can always change it again that's what we're doing right now so do we want to change it and just let it all go wild or do we want to be a consistent and uh, monitor it and make sure it's the best for our community so what change are you for trustee Regan? i'm for the very first one myself okay me too because tonight is the night to to get all this out because the last thing we need is that somebody to go out on the after first meeting one. that derails again. <laughs> you know, if, when you say the first one, are you referring to option A that's in the packet tonight? Right. Okay. Okay. I just want to be. And it gives sense, right? And and also too, it sounds like you know, with the daycare, they can't open up after a marijuana place is already they, submitted. They, they, they can. can. It doesn't. Matter. They can. No, but they uh, they can, but they it's not going to affect the marijuana license at that point. If they're not there, uh, okay. marijuana already applies, and it will. It will until the, until that marijuana establishment is in the ground and functioning. I thought once it got applied for and approved. What once it is applied for and approved and they receive a license, a daycare opening up will have zero effect. Zero on effect. Effects. 
However, the one concern we have is that between the point of filing of some an applicant submitting the verification form, which goes to the planning mm -hmm. director to say this meets the setback requirements between them and the hearing before the local licensing authority, there's a really a probably 60 day window in there yeah. that a license could a daycare could open up in that period. And that creates some uncertainty that we're concerned about. And that might so, be some clarification we need at that point. I, and I can tell you, as we've talked about it, we talked about it a little bit today. And I, I hear you, I'm, I'm get the marijuana piece. My fear is as town staff having to rely on a third party to make decisions for businesses that are investing so much money. Mm -hmm. I mean, if there was another way for us to track it, or I'm thinking, what if the website goes down? What if we lose internet connection? What if, I mean, this is our only way of accessing that information. And I, I tossed in my mind about how, how we could try to figure it out and require it of them and to register with the town, but we just, we have businesses that aren't registered with us. I mean, we have, I mean, we just, we have no way of re making it a requirement. So that's, that's, I wish, I'm trying to think of other ways that we could collect that data um, and not have to rely on a third party mm -hmm. for that information. I don't know what that looks yeah. like. There's other municipalities that run on these setbacks. They don't run on and they, schools, correct? No. I can't find any others that have in that have setbacks like this from in-home daycares. In-home daycares is specific to Wellington. Now this was included in the original voting ordinance, right? License, if someone including license daycares daycare. was in that was in ordinance. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. that's so it's the it's the in-home daycare piece that is is specific for Wellington. And I no, that, that's why I was reaching out to other municipalities. How do you handle this? What do you do? Mm -hmm. I'm like, what? Why do you have that? What well, was in the ordinance? The voters passed it. So we're just trying to figure out a way to make it make it work. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I'm not seeing any of the three options here that turn it into like uh, all of a sudden the flooding or the plethora or you know, a whole bunch of thank you, a bunch of them. Yeah. You know, I think that all of these provide some sort of reasonable cap in their own natural fluid way. I like that they put the distancing restriction on there from between marijuana shop to marijuana shop because in C3 zoning, I mean, with all of these other buffers in place, that's gonna significantly reduce the amount of options available. I mean, so I don't, I'm not really sure I can see where you're coming from that all of a sudden we're going to have like marijuana shops opening it depends on how easy we make it if i don't we start pulling things i don't think out any of, of these options are going to make no. it super easy i you know i would imagine that realistically with all three of these options there wouldn't be any more than two or three that could reasonably <coughs> open up mm -hmm. even with the first one <coughs> even with the first one right. so <coughs> That's what pretty much the vote is approved initially, correct? The first one. It is adding in the R3 zoning, which there was no R3. Right, and it, the needs in the neighborhood needs and desires was not in the ordinance. I think it fits with everything else we do in Wellington, mm -hmm. but that is something that was not included um, with the first one. Um, I agree that it needs to be added. Um, I still I understand the concerns with the um, board of adjustments. But I still stand that I, I do have an issue with one type of business not being allowed to utilize the variance process while others can. Yeah. So I would say that I would say option A, I would support with the addition of number five, which allows them to have the same appeal process as any other business. And then, but on that too, and I'm just like again, it's not devil's advocate's friend, apparently, but with the um, adjustments process. For any other business that only applies to land use, it does not apply to any licensing. So that is not something that other businesses have a benefit of that they would be excluded from because they could potentially, you know, get the adjustment for land use, but that's not within the ordinance for licensing. Do other businesses have a setback separately in their process that they have to go through outside of land use, though? No, this is this would just be applicable. Well, I mean, the land use, sure, the land is the land use is then approved for that use, 
But if that still doesn't meet the licensing requirements, mm -hmm. they still can't open a business. Well, that's a good, are there other businesses that have a foot yes. setback requirement to yes. their business? Yes. Oh, yeah. But that's okay. Sorry, that's primarily yeah. what the Got adjustments okay. are seeing. And, and yeah, and I can clarify that. Yeah, we, have, we have in our land use code, we have a lot of uses that are used by right within a zone district okay. category. But then in um, it's Article Five under the formatting, um, but it's it's the use standards. So this is an allowed use, but you also have to meet these criteria, okay. which includes setbacks. Bars and taverns have a setback from a residential property okay. in certain yeah. zone districts. And there's a there's a number of those that um, have additional use standards setbacks. Okay, I misunderstood your question. No, thank you. Okay, that, that was a question because I was like, yeah. I don't know. I'm, mm -hmm. Haven't served on either of those boards, so I was just like, are there other businesses yeah. that also have to meet separate setbacks from just their zoning? Okay. Yeah. I guess in my my point was the board of adjustments doesn't provide any um, approval for licensing purposes. I mean, like they're not like if for some reason somebody wasn't able to do the like a liquor license, mm -hmm. that's not something that we manage through board of adjustments. Right. Got it. Yeah. And and I think to that point, that was one of the topics that came right. up in our previous applications that have been submitted to the town. And that was kind of what we learned was the Board of Adjustments granted or didn't in this case grant the a variance to allow the use and the land use code. But even if they had, the licensing authority wouldn't have to honor that. So there's sure. always going to be that disconnect. That's one of the things that needs to be clarified in this. Got it. Is if the variance process is going to be looked at, it has to include and the licensing authority has you yeah. need to create that clarity that, that they also can look at that. So is there currently, so let's say at the bar, right? You have the setback requirement is 500 feet from I thought you know, say it's 500 feet. I am 498 feet. Is there any current process that I can go through to what I, I understand it's not board of adjustments, planning commission? Is there any process I can go through to request that that be considered to be changed? The process would be to obtain a variance through the Board of Adjustment. But you're saying that that wouldn't carry forward to the licensing authority because we as the Board of Trustees, we're the licensing authority for liquor establishments. So even if the Board of Adjustments approved your 498, yeah. then it would come to us as the Board of Trustees, which I understand we have to I don't to think that's correct, but I'll lean on Dan I, to clarify. The Board, of, board yes. of Trustees is currently appointed a licensing authority. Is, not, is for, not for liquor. For liquor, we are the licensing oh, authority. Yeah. Yeah. I'm liquor. sorry. I'm sorry. Marijuana, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. sorry. Okay. No, no, so no, no. I'm trying to say, so if the same situation were to happen, but for a liquor store, which we are the licensing authority, Board of Adjustment says, yes, you're fine at 498 because it's two feet. That doesn't carry forward to the Board of Trustees because we then look at their license and we say, well, wait, you're at 498, you're supposed to be 500. But the 500 feet in that case is in the, is in the land use. Land use so the variance actually would, it's a variance of the, light, the land use. Mm -hmm. and, and it, so that would carry forward to their use then. It, but that, that's still issue a license. The, the Board of Trustees could issue the license. Then. But could we then turn and deny it because we say, well, you're not 500? Could that happen? Well, I mean, for that specific, because that's the question here. If, if the Board of Adjustment says, you are approved to have this setback. Is the licensing authority then bound to say, hey, we honor that based on what you got approved, if that's the same as what it would be for marijuana? I understand that the, the distances are different. So that's what I'm trying to say is if that variance you get from one business type carries forward to your licensing process, which if you what you just said is true, it does. But if it does in that case, not, in that case it does. In that case, it does. In that case it does. So then why would we not allow marijuana to go through the same process? Where if you get, right, if a liquor store gets the variance for the two feet, the marijuana store should be able to do the exact same thing. It shouldn't be, well, because your marijuana, your variance doesn't count for the licensing authority, but the liquor store's variance does count. That's my concern. So. I think that's a fair, pretty fair summary. Okay. And that yeah. setback does apply for licensing and land use for liquor? That setbacks in our land use code. Right, and I don't think it's in licensing. It's not in our license code, no. that's right. That's right. why the Board of Justice can provide that. Yep. Very yeah. So there is no, so, so it's not, not, for, it's not a, it doesn't, it doesn't have a separate use setback outside. It doesn't of, have a separate licensing setback. If, if okay. okay. So it's not Marijuana has a separate licensing setback separate from what is in the land use code. It's in the same place, but it applies to both because of the way the ordinance was written, which is. Okay. Which is why we're looking for clarity here. <laughs> so would the clarity then be to 
established that the setbacks are in the land use code and are separate from the licensing. So the licensing yeah. then just looks at you, it was approved. Yes, I just need to take this back two steps and make sure that I'm understanding what Trustee Gator is presenting. I just want to make sure I'm clearly understanding this. So this whole time, somebody could have applied for a variance for a setback to the Board of Adjustments, and we would not have to be having this conversation because I thought we already had this conversation once. This was what Trustee Gator is presenting is or talking about is really what the ordinance that was in front of the board three times uh, at this point, um, beginning in December, which is to allow marijuana license marijuana applicants to go to the Board of Adjustment to seek a variance from those distances, okay. and then making that if they receive a variance, carries forward to then the that car carries forward to licensing authority. At the moment, okay. if they went to the Board of Adjustment for a variance. The Board of Adjustment can grant a variance in the land use code, but the local licensing authority still cannot issue a license if it's within the setbacks. So that's what's been, in, that's what we have proposed in the past. So then the hang up there was, was that the appeal process wasn't approved by the voter, so it wasn't. The, like, what was the, the hang up? The, the hang up was, it, I guess, is it was in two different places. And so the licensing authority isn't necessarily bound by the, right. by the, the, by adjustment. the board of adjustments and what we were what is originally presented what i've been an advocate of if it gets approved by the board of adjustments the licensing authority needs to respect that uh, that approval that so okay but then we're putting marijuana licensing approval preemptively in the hands of the oh board no of adjustments. oh no no they can still get denied for anything else on their mm -hmm. list it's just for that one thing so okay if if i check the boxes for everything um, if we add community approval, neighborhood wants it, I meet everything, background, all of that, but I'm at 498 from public, the licensing authorities can say you can't have it. But if the Board of Adjustment said, hey, you're at 498, we approve this setback, this variance, this variance sorry, mm -hmm. then the licensing authority cannot say you check all of the other boxes, but you, can't but you don't check the 500, you can't have it. They have to give it to you if you check all the other. Now, you could get the approval for 498. But let's say that you <laughs> failed two or three of the other ones, you you, you may not get your license. So mm -hmm. go back to the original. <laughs> yeah, back to the original. Like it's it's not a good idea. In my, right. my very professional opinion on board of adjustments and having been through a lot of adjustment cases, putting all of the emphasis for one application type on a non-elected group, it doesn't create consistency or clarity for from a legislative standpoint for the applicants, for the residents, because your board members change over time based on appointments. They are looking at site specific criteria, which in that instance is not going to be looked at consistently on a case by case basis, which is what your setback distances provides is that clarity. I don't recommend the Board of Adjustments as an option moving forward. And another issue is essentially every applicant for everybody who wants to open a marijuana establishment in the town of Wellington starts with the Board of Adjustment. Yeah. So it really changes the focus of that entity to it will be hearing various requests for marijuana and a lot of them. Okay. Yeah. So, Mayor, uh, I'll just sum mine up for the points that uh, Trustee Daly provided early on and for that right there. My preference would be option B or C. Thank you. We're going to know option A. I prefer option A. I am with option A. Option A with five. A with five. And I will like to add five to that as well. Okay. Because that guarantees that they do have the same application process as every other business in town for variance, correct? Makes a mess of things, but it's sure. Sure. I have a uh, concern with that if our you know staff is really discouraging it as an option just because they're the ones who agree with it administratively. Oh, that's yeah. funny enough. Um, I'm a big fan of option C, and the reason why is this um, we receive a lot of public comment from residential folks of concerns of setbacks, and it sounds like an increase in that slightly um, would. Kind of offset some of the other changes that are, are proposed in option C. And I think they make sense from the use case. Again, they're not opening up a million locations. I think what it's doing is causing, it's, it's making it more fair. Um, and it's increasing setbacks on a couple items, which makes sense. We don't want 
the marijuana district, right? Um, we want uh, more room from residential potentially. So I think, although it is changing setbacks, I think it is doing it in a fair way that has the intention of protecting our residents from you know those concerns they had. And then I'm also I'm like part of that too, the in-home daycares. It's kind of like one of those things where we create a rule, but we can't really enforce it because we don't have control over it. I mean, we talked about that quite a bit, you know. Um, I mean, what's the point if it's not consistent? If you look at a website one day with filters that should include it, you look at it another day with filters that should include it, and they they miss six daycares. Um, that's not reliable, and we can't hold people to standards that aren't reliable. So um, I think it's one of those things we can't enforce. And if we can't enforce it, I don't know how we're holding people reliable for us. Does our liquor licensing authority, when they go through all these applications, verify daycares? Is that one liquor of the requirements? Have not liquor, it's marijuana licensing authority. Does she? Is that not one of the requirements? Is the verification of she? It's, it's a requirement to get a license is they have to get a certain it. setback from, from daycares. Well, there's the, and, say, and do they look into it? The, the, only, the only source that she has is the same source that we have. But she's highly experienced in accessing the data. Not, I mean, she doesn't look, I mean, she's the licensing authority in Commerce City, which also doesn't use, doesn't use daycares as a setback. Um, at, she has the same source of information that we have. Is the state setback for schools is that like 500 feet or something across the state 500 to 1000 feet is much more common for setbacks from schools okay but like i said like uh, in-home daycares is not something we've seen pretty much anywhere else so like theoretically if we change from one the person that we're using now to somebody else that is used to using those state standards that they could potentially miss some of those like sure i mean yeah, I mean, that's one of the concerns I've had with, I mean, after using, so I, I like to think of myself as technologically savvy, but the fact that I was a, I missed daycares, I couldn't find daycares that I knew existed kind of concerned me that, you know, if, if Cody's not in the office and somebody else is filling out the form, I, I'm concerned about that form being filled out wrong. And and while that's a burden on us, it's, it's a real burden that has real impacts on the town and on applicants uh, because we have a hard time verifying this data. It's... It, it sounds like to say that websites hard to use. It's very, very poor. And if we're relying on that as our sole tool to verify something that impacts somebody's ability to open a license, uh, open a shop, it opens up to a lot of potential liability if we do it wrong. And I think there's a lot of ways we could do it wrong. And that's why I'm saying I highly recommend removing that from the equation because that is our sole source of that information. And I, and I think it's very problematic. And then the double-edged sword is, is that if we try and implement a special tracking system for our own, it's going to be just Worse. the same. It's going to be tough to track. I mean, if, if the issue of, you know, if we had to register with the town of Wellington, if an in-home daycare had to register, well, our code says that, or the ordinance says it has to be a licensed daycare. So actually, then they would register with the town and get a business license. They might actually have an active business license, but they might let their state daycare license Lapse. Those two things are not tied together. I mean, really, they are, but just because they surrender their state daycare license doesn't mean that they would automatically come into the town. So we actually couldn't rely on either source of information, I don't think, accurately to verify that information. So that's, I think, it's a real problem. But um, we can accurately verify schools and commercial daycares. Schools and commercial daycares, there's a lot more process involved. In home daycares come and go much quicker. And because of the state preemption of in-home daycare licensing, zoning, and everything else, the town kind of has to take a hands-off approach to in-home daycare. But when it comes to a, a commercial child care center, yeah, we're involved. We're involved in the site plan. We're involved in the business app. I mean, there, there's a lot more there. At a school, certainly. We know where that is. The other thing about schools and, and commercial daycare centers is they don't come and go like at the in-home child care center. I have a big question. What is yeah. the government entity at the state that manages the in-home daycares? Uh, it's from the Childhood Council. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nice. Are they the ones that upload the information to the website? Yes. I'm assuming that information is public information. It's on the website. Is that correct? That's absolutely right. 
And, so yeah. can you send an email to Early Childhood Council and say, can you please provide me a list of any daycares within 80549? My experience working with them and trying to find that exact information is it takes a long time to get the information back and the response is you can find that information on Colorado Shores. It's been my experience as well. So that is, that is this is their source of that information. This is how that information is made public. It is the only place. So, I'm side note, it's sad to think about how much sales tax revenue we're losing from not identifying these daycares. No, there's no sales tax unless you're selling children. No, yeah. but so they don't have to pay anything as far as being a daycare facility. There's no. nothing that goes back to the town whatsoever. No. 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 Um, the benefit of having in, in community town care in our community, yeah, there's, a, there's a, certainly a service need that's needed in the community, yeah. but there's no sales tax collected on a, on a daycare. And it enables a lot of other people to receive sales tax by yeah. caring for their children. Um, the footprint of a school or commercial daycare is big. And it kind of makes sense for the larger setback. When we talk about in-home daycares, we're looking at some in-home daycares on one side of the interstate that exclude properties on the other side of the interstate because that setback is so big. Um, so, well, I mean, I don't think that's fair. That doesn't make sense because those aren't kids who are going to happen upon the store. Um, they're on the other side of the interstate, but that setback distance is still excluding some property. Yeah, I mean, these kids are in a home, in a residential area. Where they would why, why are we zoning a home the exact same as we're zoning a school where there's hundreds, if not thousands of children, especially when they're already protected by the residential? I don't, to me, that's, that's my, my hang up. Why are we, why are we doing this for something that could pop up or close, you know? within the 60 day period of an application, it increases liability for us. When in all reality, some at home daycares are like five kids. That's no different than a group of five kids leaving the junior high and going to their buddy's house while their parents are gone. I mean, what what's the, what's the difference? Can anybody answer me that? Those kids are there every day, all day, five days a week or more. They probably get out a lot more children in public school. <laughs> I mean, when I was in daycare, we stayed. At the <laughs> we didn't. We went everywhere. Walks, nature walks, stuff like that. Well, there's a big difference for the adult supervision ratio to children with a commercial daycare and a school. Like, like I'm more concerned about the one to thirty adult to child ratio. More, far less I am with an in-home daycare where it's one person where they can. Most of the time, unless they're like a licensed preschool, have can only have like up to five. So like there's like eyes on those kids with those in-home daycares, and they should be a little bit more supervised. And generally, those kids are under school age, right? So they shouldn't be like out wandering around without some without supervision. I hope they're not wandering around. That would not be a great daycare. <laughs> so like I completely understand that setback requirement for the commercial daycares and the schools like that makes sense because those kids are walking up and down the streets and in transit so it makes sense to keep that restricted but I completely understand the liability that the staff is trying to set us up for success on and keep them out of trouble where there's this huge like in between period where somebody could be applying for a license have invested millions of dollars set up their businesses ready to and then at day 53 a, a licensed daycare sets up and that is outside the scenario that you guys are doing like whether or not you can find existing one that's one thing but whether or not one opens in the middle of your process where you've already received your land use approval to move on so that's completely something that you can't control or manage or have a heads up about at all because if there's a license in progress, the state is going to provide, but has it after we've already provided our approval, they bought a property for $2 million. What is, is, do there, we, do we, okay, is there any way that we can put in this, you know, if they've applied for the marijuana license? I mean, that's the state. If, if we're no, but I mean, state. still, I mean, oh. if they've applied like on January 1st, a daycare opens up uh, within no, 60 days, 20 days, yeah, you know, whatever. Right. You know, whoever opens for, I mean, whoever applies first, I mean, I would think that would make sense. 
and then, but in that case, then we have that establishment near daycare. So I right. mean, if we're but trying to pull that it, reason, did, it wasn't there, it's just kind of like, uh, you know, if the marijuana place established and then a daycare opens afterwards, right. that's okay with that. But they would know about it. And it's the same thing, the daycare might not want to open somewhere where a marijuana But, place um, but I think, I, I think, is that possible? I like the wording on that one. Yeah. They have to meet the setback. They have to meet the setbacks as of their application. Right. Mm -hmm. As, as of the application submission dates. of the verification. Yes. Board. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, I mean, we could we could write that in, and that's just yeah, that's that's that would take that off the table. Right. Yeah. We're, At that we're point, requesting verification on an unreliable source. Okay. Like no. why? We no, they upload it within an so, hour. Okay, so when we say unreliable source, <laughs> if, if the point is the government entity that tracks this says this is the source you have to use, I'm sorry, there's that's what we got to use. That's what right? we got to use. I mean, that that is what well, if the state government's going to say there's no other way to get this information, that's it. And if we put it as of your mm -hmm. confirmation, and maybe internally staff just says, hey, we're going to you know hold it a day or two till Cody's back in the office to double confirm, okay, a day or two to make sure it's correct. I don't have a problem with as of the day that you submit your completed application to staff, they confirm your setbacks. Those are what carry forward. If something changes after you set your application, and that's not on you. Yep. You have done to the best of your ability. Your now, mm -hmm. there may be a need to make sure, you know, your application can't drag on for a year and a half, right? If you just keep delaying it or something. But, you know, as long as there's no undue delays on your part, it's it's, it's off you. On the town's part, you mean? Yeah, on the applicant's part. So if the applicant delays their application for two years for stuff on their own end, oh, I see. and they're like, I put my application today, and two years from now I'll get around to finishing it, right. not that's not going to fly. But as long as you know you're applying everything, there's no, and I, I believe there's already processes in place in the land use code about timelines and things like that. I don't remember for yeah, this is the land use code yeah. application. But, okay, it's, 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 I think they take the but as long, off of both people. Yeah, point. because then at that point, you need to meet them as of the time that you are submitting your final application, right? Your, your mm -hmm. finished application, you need to meet those requirements. But if, I, I, that will be somewhat problematic in implementation because if the date that they submit it, if the staff reviewing it isn't there and they review it two days later, something comes in during that gap between application and review, there could still be a discrepancy. What if we did it at the moment of the review or the moment of application? At the moment of review. Is it? Yeah, this sounds. I, like, if, uh, if that's the direction, I mean, it's, it's yeah. we can draft it. It's yeah. it's totally. It's not something we've considered, and so it's um. We just need so to we we need board direction. We need. Yeah, we so need, I yeah, submit I an application to Cody. We need to air it all out tonight. Yeah, How do I find out for for my marijuana shop? I submit my application <laughs> to you. What is my point that I find out that you've checked all the boxes that everything's appropriate? Is that an email from you? Is that a phone call? What is that? The setback and the zoning setback verification application states that the application will, will be reviewed within four days. Okay. Yeah. And so at the end of those four days, I hear from you, yes, you need everything, you're verified. <laughs> what do I get at the end of four days? Right. Yeah, the application form has two pages. The second page has the the standards that are based yep. on the current yep. regulations yep. with a box for each one. Is it satisfied or yes? Those are filled out with a yes, satisfied, or no, not satisfied. And that application form is returned to the applicant. Okay. And then if I check all the boxes is satisfied, that's considered signed as approved. Signed as approved. Or verified, I guess verified. is the technical okay. term. Yeah. My point is at that point that Cody or whoever in his office signs that form that they meet those check boxes. Great. If there's a difference of within those three days, something but at that point, I would understand that is the first step of a much longer process of things that they have to go through, correct? Okay, so that helps us to address the issue of they've invested all this time and hours and life into this, and then all of a sudden it changes. I'm sorry, there might be a four-day period. It's very unlikely, but it could happen that something changes within a four-day period. But I think that as long as we do within that, it provides a much better solution that allows us that you are being a good partner and doing your part to say, hey, I have met your requirement here. If somebody else comes in and changes that after the fact, that's not on me, right? I didn't go tell them, open this daycare across the street from my center, and we can't control that. Mm -hmm. And I agree at that point, it is outside of our control. But what is in our control is at the time of submitting the application, checking the official state-provided system, 
it meets the requirements. And it's checking the state required, the state provided solution. The state's not giving us an option of email me a list. I would love that option, but if the state's not going to do it, we have to use it what the state's going to give us. So I've heard concerns of, and I don't know the validity of this, but it has been brought up by public comment and also by trustee panel that daycares <coughs> potentially be bought out or encouraged to not function anymore in order to reduce that requirement of uh, that setback. Um, that's bad that we need to have it. Um, but who am I to say what you do with the business if you want to sell it, you sell it. Right. right. Mm -hmm. The but, one thing with that is, I would think, whether it's a 2,000 foot setback, 1,500 foot setback, or a 1,000 foot setback, you're going to run into the same thing. If somebody, if that's all that's hindering them, if somebody wants to open it up, they're going to try to buy them out. Okay. Could we discuss the, the distance of the setback, though? One side of the interstate, when we say we want this all potentially on I-25 corridor, and, and daycares on the east side are prohibiting for that from happening when they're separated by an interstate. Yeah. So I don't think that makes sense. Because those kids surely better not wander right. across the interstate. Um, and again, this is going to be a living, breathing document. I mean, we're going to be reviewing this probably yearly. Yeah. And hopefully not here. I sure hope hopefully it's gonna run great. <laughs> we don't have to but, we can <laughs> but we can always change it down the road. I mean, this yeah, is a, this is an existing that's situation. What, that's right what now. we were, were trying to do right trying, now. Right, trying mm -hmm. to get her done. Right. Yeah. But does that make sense to you guys if there's a daycare on yeah, the Yeah, I mean daycares don't I mean it doesn't make sense for a home daycare to mm -hmm. have the same limitations on marijuana establishment. As do we have anything over on the east side of the road? Yeah. That's a zone for marijuana right oh, now. Yeah. Oh, 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 for mar zone know. for marijuana? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm talking about the, the Palm Bears is zone C3, mm -hmm. so is the property across the street. There are, C there are C3 mm -hmm. zones on the east side of the highway. But oh, the one across the street is owned so by the fire district. There's a private property there as well. Oh, there is. There, that's two parcels where the oh, fire right. district owns one on the east end and the west side next to the okay. highway is owned by private. Got it. Okay. But I don't so, think I that was one of those questions that makes sense that an east side daycare would prohibit something on the I-25 corridor where we're talking about we would encourage that traffic to be from opening. That doesn't right. make sense. All right. What's the average age of a kid in a daycare? Up to 12. Under six. Under six. Yes. Because otherwise they're at school. Yes. Right. But they go after school, school and yeah. they walk to those places after school. They're probably running more marijuana walking to the daycare than they would having more within a thousand feet. I like your suggestion because it does not change the ordinance. It just covers um, the people that do submit their application. I, like I said, I don't know what properties are possibly affected because it's not identified in these maps. So, but as it sits now, I don't mind the idea as of the date submitted. Um, You were draft. I mean, it, it's absolutely doable. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, uh, just but when you say it doesn't change the ordinance, it 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 will change yes. the ordinance. Yes. I mean, the, the 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 referred ordinance is not clear about yes. a lot, and so in order to make that clear and are, right, it, it is going to be more than just yes. a couple lines in the ordinance. Right. It yeah. will be a whole process that's created. So yeah. be aware, it, it is doing. It, it is going to be a rather substantial section addition. Yeah. And my understanding is there are zero properties that fall within the criteria for setback. Correct. 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 Other than the one that's that was already like annexed and zoned. Yeah. So so before that, then there were zero properties for right. an entire town without a requirement of rezoning. So this if if somebody were to play devil devil's advocate, they might say that even though the voters approved it. We prohibited it through for actually having yeah. anything open. That sounds like lawsuits to me. <laughs> so um, I, I just I, our liability is huge. I think so. I, I guess here's a question: Can we get sued by the residents for changing their vote? No, they gave no, us permission. Permission to change. Got, no. so I was I just, mean, just no, in general. Just in general. Yeah. Um, 
Are you proposing a different option? We've had people share their options, Mayor. Are you proposing a different combination of things? Um, you, I know you're kind of highlighting different things. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a big fan of throwing five in with a, I'll say that right away. I don't think Board of Adjustment should have anything to do with it at this point. Um, I'd be with C out of any of them. Um, I think that has the broadest zoning that is super clear that it won't change or can't change by an in home daycare popping up or closing. Because um, it, it just, um, I, I can't wrap my head around why we would zone an in home daycare any differently than residential. And there are kids hanging out at homes in those residential areas unsupervised most of the time when there's multiples at just a house compared to ones that are under the age of six <clears throat> somebody who's supervising them i don't i mean that doesn't make sense to me well and then i mean are we really comparing apples to apples here i mean because how many liquor stores and, and bars are these kids gonna you know do they walk by at the same time i mean are they any right. safer than walking by a marijuana facility that has twice the security than right i mean you're not getting into the marijuana facility by any means if you're looking when you're six i don't think you're getting into the liquor store at the same time though unless you're looking at all i don't know um yeah, marijuana facilities are incredibly controlled they're not, no, they're and then if we're the only in municipality area. that's using in home daycare, that we could find. I mean, we did that do, we could I mean, find. I researched yeah, everyone, find. but those that I called, and maybe, them. maybe there's a reason for that because of what a mess it turns it into. Do we want to be setting, do we want to be addressing this ordinance as the voters intended for us to do within a year? And doing nothing with it and leaving it a mess? Is that what we want? I think we're getting a little bit of clarity right now from what we're discussing. And maybe down the road, we can do a little more broader maybe at that point, but I still think right now, a, option A is the best one, especially with the clarification of making sure that the date of application is, you know, you can't have some zealot out there that's mm -hmm. anti-marijuana go in and open up daycare centers just because you've got marijuana places coming in. I mean, once it's locked in, it's locked in. And mm -hmm. I think that takes the problem off the city. It takes, uh, gives clarity to both the marijuana people and I think the city at that point at that. Are we ourselves being zealous by not changing? Well, maybe we should be. I don't know. I myself, I think we should. Across the freeway, <laughs> that makes sense. And I live on that side. It makes sense, but something on the east side of the freeway prohibits a property on the west side. Tell me this. Does that make any sense? For, for the core reason of why you think that setback should exist for in-home daycare. It, it, it doesn't matter, sense? right? Unless, you, in, unless we draw a line down I-25 and say these things are not going to cross one way or the other, right? The fact is all the public or all the school setbacks already go across the interstate anyway, mm -hmm. right? So unless we're going to draw a line and say these things do not interact with each other, which yeah. I'm not sure that's a route we want to go down. I, I'm not necessarily opposed to option C, but I would still want to see the school and the commercial preschools number at 2000 mm. in the possible changes. If, if we think that this is going to be a serious liability and the fact that we don't think the data is accurate, which I, I don't, from what I've heard tonight, I'm not, I'm not sure that I fully believe that. I think the data is there and I think it is accurate. It's just a matter of getting it looked up in the right way. But even still, I would not be opposed to option C, but again, I would want to see Two thousand new schools and commercial preschools. Yes. And excluding in-home daycares from school. 
if, if, we, if we truly think that that is a liability, I think that paves the way for option C. So are we absolutely positive that it creates a liability? With uncertainty, there's always a risk. But there is a risk that it couldn't, could or couldn't. Either which uh, way you go. Already at this point, we have applicants that are, um, I mean, there, there's a question about whether it currently applies to in-home daycares. There's applicants who are saying that they don't believe it is, and, and they're kind of waiting to see what the board does. Uh, there's there's chance that we do nothing. Um, yeah, we can get to it. Um, it's possible. That's absolutely right. Um, if we do nothing and we, if there's some foul up in the verification form, um, which I think is, it, yeah, the website's in theory works and it provides good information. I'll just, but yeah, applicants who use it and provide find wrong information and said that they had used it found wrong information. Um, so see, I think there's uncertainty there. So I think, I think the risk of a verification form being signed, not signed, um, based on that information is, is a problem. I don't know. I would almost propose an increase to the residential zone over an increase to the, the schools in the commercial. Yeah, and option C does include increased setback for public and for shop to shop. Yeah. So that's additional above and beyond the existing ordinance protections for those two setbacks. That's the only reason I'd consider that one. And that's what offsets, you know, some of the other right. changes yeah. to consider. So I mean, I would like to see, you know, how that two thousand for the schools and commercial preschools would impact you know, the map piece. <laughs> but you know, I would be more you favorable. Have, you already have that. That's, well, that's the first no. map. No, with a no with a two thousand. So oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I get you. There, yeah. Well, okay. Right, with the other mm -hmm. ones, because I mean, Pussy really brought up a, a really great point. You know, if we're trying to create that buffer between in home, you know, the potential for in home daycares, you know, that is satisfied to that residential zone piece. Mm -hmm. So instead of, you know, increasing the schools and commercial preschools, we can increase that residential zone one. You know, another 250 feet, and that would help create that additional space. Without does it not really significantly though? impacting a lot of the C3 with all, the all of this residential? Does it really <coughs> increase it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, when you look at liquor licensing, a lot of those setbacks are around 500 feet. Mm -hmm. I mean, so everything that we're proposing is more restrictive. Than liquor licensing or the state marijuana licensing. We're kids unsupervised at the park and in the neighborhood. So, like, right. if we were going to increase somewhere, that really, I, I think. Right. Those I'm are more than, I'd be more concerned about kids that are unsupervised. Right. So, so, so what parks. numbers do you guys want to see on C? What numbers do you want to see for, for people? That... I'm liking it because this is double already. Yeah. I, I, I like we keep, we keep, let's think about it this way. So a thousand foot from an existing establishment, a thousand feet from public schools. You're saying two thousand, and then residential. What are you thinking? Right here, it's two fifty. Well, you're thinking three hundred, four hundred. Mr. McDonald yeah, saying five hundred like liquor. Increased that, yeah. I'd, I'd five hundred like liquor. Five hundred eliminates primarily all the secret. That's yeah. what I was thinking. So that's, that's what I was that's looking at because all of this yeah. residential. Wipes that out to the street side. Yeah. For the well, that's, but that's already wiped out here. But that's this one's only 250. If we go up to five, if you look on this one right here, but it has no effect on this mm -hmm. because that's already closed. So yeah. Not here, closed. But everything, everything that has residential that backs up to C3 would be eliminated. And that's, that's I 25 corridor. Uh, that's, that's the frontage road. So I don't think that meets a lot of our other goals here. So, but 250, that's an increase. I mean, my whole lot's 50 feet. So that's a whole other house or potentially lack of house. Well, and when you look at the possible changes in that other marijuana thousand foot setback, if like after that one goes up that's right in the middle of town, I mean, that leaves maybe an option on the north side and maybe an option on the south side. So, I mean, I'm not really seeing how we're worried about a gazillion of these things opening up. Yeah, there's really no space still to anything. So, so if we make any adjustments to the 
to the possible changes in option C, we're going to be right back to where we started talking ourselves in circles because we're adding and more restrictions at this point. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they have beat I these think, numbers to a pulp. Yeah. I think the 1500 is, uh, it makes sense. And if you really compare the 1500 to the 2000, when you're looking at the large school in that separation, I mean, it's pushing it out to major streetways well beyond anything that's local to the actual I mean, school. see, so is your, you save everyone a lot of time. If your goal is just to open more shops in town, choose how many you want, set a number, and stop with the setbacks okay. because you keep saying, don't change this, don't change that, because it'll close off more areas for more shops. If you just want more shops in town, just pick a number. I okay. want this many more marijuana shops That's in town. Cap. I don't like caps. I don't think we should have caps. <coughs> right. I don't think we should change our setbacks. <coughs> you guys keep saying change the setbacks, oh, but don't change it because this will knock out more properties. So if your goal is to not knock out C3 properties, why are you even talking about setbacks? Our goal the goal here is to allow market. more than you want business in Great. Town, so pick right? a number. Is that correct? From, sounds like that's your goal, is what it sounds like. Well, so as, a, as, a, as a town, shouldn't we be avoiding litigation? I think we should be upholding what was put in place in terms of the setbacks. There were very specific setbacks that were put in place. And I think we should stand on those. Those were approved by the voters. Even the voters, voters were also voted, they hated them. We could change it. I know they did. That doesn't mean that we have to change them. Right. So it means we can, and they voted that we could. And I'm, that's fine. I'm Not just saying you, you keep talking about right. changing setbacks, to, to, trying to make it so there could be more. If that's your goal, that's fine. Just pick a number. And, and it makes it super simple because you don't have to gerrymander around this, that, and the other thing. Just pick your number. You I'm, want I'm, three, I'm, not three. Fan, I'm not a fan of caps. I don't think that that's, that's the intent here. I think the intent is to provide clarity a, a situation so that as the market changes and the town evolves and we're annexing future properties into town, we're creating reasonable distances for businesses to come and develop in the community. So like naturally with the setbacks that have been provided, the market will be limited unless the town grows. And then when the town does grow by the limitations that we've set, we'll it's be able scalable. to create reasonable distances that make sense. If I were to go outside right now and say, where's 2000 feet from where I'm standing? No idea. But what the 2000 feet represents is a significant distance. Like, right, that's what 2000 feet means. I could do, I could do like 300 yards, go, I got it. But I cannot tell you 2000 feet from where I'm standing, where that perimeter would be, right? I, the, the purpose of 2000 is to make sure it's a big distance, right? 1500, I mean, if you're taking some and giving some somewhere else, that makes sense to me, especially if we're using the feedback we've received with people to make these adjustments. So 1,500 feet is significant. That's a lot. I mean, look at the blues, right? This is the this is the 1,500 feet, right? That's like that's a significant part of our town, right? Surrounding any school, that's big. So and then you plop a marijuana one somewhere in where there's not one of those circles, yeah. and then all of a sudden there's this great big thousand foot radius, and then it's gone again until there's growth and development, right? So. I don't know. But if the answer to this is just to increase all setbacks, I don't think that's meeting our goals either. So, I mean, I appreciate the ones that are increased because I think that makes sense for what the people want. But um, I don't think that that goes without any compromise anywhere. Otherwise, we're just increasing um, limitations. What, while I appreciate that, we're trying to come to a decision. <laughs> I think, Trustee, you had mentioned earlier that you were good with option C. I am, but not with the maintaining at 2000. So that's where I'm, that's where the thing is. I mean, we're talking about 500 feet at this point, right? So, I mean, you can't take 500, oh, add 500 here, add 50 here, and then that's it, right? I feel like that has to be a give and take. And I think the give and take happens with the school setback because 1500 is still a lot. It's, so, it's the biggest. It would be the largest and the biggest priority, of course, for us. So respectfully, we are removing 17 times 2,000 feet in setbacks in option C. So when you talk about give and take, when you talk about 500 feet on actual schools, 
you're neglecting that we're taking out 17 locations currently that have a 2,000 foot setback that will be removed with option C. That's a lot of gift. That, that 17 like includes all licensed daycares, not just daycare. So yeah, okay. that also includes commercial. Okay. Yeah. Just so you know, maybe ten. I, don't know. I just want to clear. The schools are kind of nice because they have the school plus the alpha best preschool. That's right. Uh, yeah. I think that's a great point, and I think that's a good reason why we should keep those two thousand. I'd like to see a map then. If we could just as a follow up then, if we are going to provide any option C with two thousand, option C with two thousand, and then in my mind, those are the two that I. I be willing to weigh against each other. Option C, 15, option C, 2,000. Mm -hmm. And then you're still wanting option A with five. I would prefer five. I am willing to work out. If we're going to say we're not going to allow the board adjustments, I think we need to figure out a process for marijuana to <laughs> appeal. <coughs> Whether that comes to the board of trustees, I don't know what that looks like. That can, I am fine with that being worked out separately, so we don't have to tie all of the other stuff up with this. I'm fine with coming back to that, but yes, I, I I'm not in support of C. Um, I think that if you're going to look at C, um, that's you look at what Trustee Mason said on that. I'm not supportive of C, so um, I would be in support of A, even if we don't add number five if we come back and visit that one down the road. So I'd like to see a map with the two thousands that was suggested on option C, the, and can we please just get one? I mean, I'll Google it and look it up or call Early Childhood Center if I have to, but like one that actually shows where the 17 facilities actually are located. There's a previous map that you provide, oh, that wasn't in the packet. Yeah, Colorado right. shines. Right. Five the, mile radius. That is the, the tool available to us to find the locations mm -hmm. of the facilities. Um, to Trustee Gator's point, there, there has been a map that was created by staff that showed the, at least approximate at that point, right. because we did it with a map and compass before we had the GIS sure. capability to do it. Um, but it was created as a means to illustrate where right. the, some of the in-home facilities yeah. are located. That has changed a number of times as okay. as daycares have come and gone. So we'd have to continue to recreate that to illustrate it. I would do the filter in the way for one mile, take a <laughs> screenshot of the date and time and say, according to your source, your website that you said is the only way to do this. I pulled it at this time the day I'm uh, providing my review, and this is what your source says. And it's missing mm -hmm. things. And we've already confirmed that that's an issue with the folder. Okay, I just will throw that out there. Yeah, with the, the trends that I'm seeing with childcare licensing requirements and the retraction of, you know, a lot of what they're doing relative to that, I don't think that having this reasonable expectation of trying to rely on this information to be accurate is going to be uh, sustainable long term. I am favorable to option C, and, I, you know, I'd like to see the two considerations by Trustee Mason and Trustee Daly. You know how that okay. those are impacted. And your A without five. Without five. Okay. You guys got your direction? <laughs> you got C, you got C we're, all, we're all doing this heavy side. I'm looking sits. at future meetings in doing this. So C as it sits with 2,000 foot setback on the school. A map including the daycare. And then option A, just option, just option A. So may I make a suggestion that you who are in favor of C pick a number now and then it can be amended. So either pick 1500 or 2000 and then add, because we don't want to have like three different ordinances. I'm at 2000. Have one or the other, pick a C. You guys who are in favor of C, pick one, 15 or 2000. Have them bring that and then at the meeting when we see the map, then if you feel otherwise, you can amend it to change the distance from either 1500 to 2000 or 2015 versus having three different ordinances. 
being proposed. Mm -hmm. Have okay. two ordinances. One are you for requesting eight. that we bring an ordinance on this? I was getting that we were no. requesting that we have another work session with more no, maps. Please. No, 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 no. Okay, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Can I um, no. <laughs> no. Ordinance. We, you want us to draft ordinances? Yes. yes. Draft so ordinances. I would say bring one for A, one for C, and you guys would see pick a number, two thousand or fifteen hundred, and then at the meeting, if looking at the map, you feel whatever number's in there is not appropriate, then you can do an amendment to the ordinance or just the number. I don't want to do that. That doesn't feel clear. Yeah. I would be I way more comfortable having- I want to have both options in front of me before yeah. I say it. So you three orders. Three, three yeah. orders. Yes. And then in the packet. And we can number them A, B, and C or whatever. So yeah. that way you just choose and then that would whichever one gets yeah. adopted would be the one. Thank you. That will help keep the motion much cleaner, I think. When do you bring this up? To the board for next meeting. Next week. We got on the twenty fifth. Can you pull that? Are up? we? Are you also wanting to add in the piece about the? I don't. Will they have enough time to do it? Correct. Mm -hmm. We're not adding that other piece about no. uh, the date, the no. time of verification no. form. That's because out. The, no. well, the time of verification only matters if yes. A is approved. If, if C is approved, right. the, the date cards don't matter anymore. Mm -hmm. But if you want us to bring, if you want us to bring A. That uh, needs to be in that. That needs to be in it, yeah. Yes. You want that included in A. If you want A with that addition. Yes. That if right? you can pull it together, that's fine. Or if you want to put another week out, that's fine. I, I, I think it needs to be added, but I don't care. If I mean, basically, in, in order to get in the packet, it has to be done by Thursday. Mm -hmm. I mean, so. That, I'm saying that if, if A passes um, and you need to bring that one piece back. So you're willing piece? to consider A without that piece in it? No. I want all of it, but if you cannot get it together in time, I don't want to delay everything else on that one thing. I think he just wants direction. Yes, if you can get it together to us, yes, bring that with A. If I cannot get it, you want A without that? Yes. Is that the direction? Is, you want to consider A without that piece in it? I mean, I that's, that's really what you're asking is me to bring A with whatever I can get done. If, if you will consider that without that piece, yes, I'm happy to. I will. I would almost think we need to have that in there when we vote on it. Right. Just for... The, the both sides to know the clarity. The text, the, yeah, we're the, talking about clarity at this point. Yeah. So I would say it needs to come with it then. If that's yeah. one of the things where yeah. we're looking at protecting both sides, yeah, then yeah. that protects both sides. Okay. So if we can get it done, we'll have it on the May 23rd meeting. If not, it'll be June 13th. Perfect. Cool. Okay. Okie dokie. <laughs> Sounds good. Because we've got a placeholder for it and both <laughs> meetings, just in case. <laughs> I won't be at the meeting. You won't be on the 23rd. Okay. That's going to be actually June 13th. We'll be fine. Okay. We'll see what we can do. All right. So we, we, can we, can create. we believe in you, Dan, and appreciate you so much. This is a big deal. need to get so. it right that fast. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, that's important. That's, yep. that's more important to me. So. Yep, yep. This is a big deal. Thanks, you guys. Good discussion. On to the library boards. <laughs> He's like, I changed my mind. I'm sick now. <laughs> so Dan will be doing the majority of this presentation. He's looking through his notes. So, I'll, so this is a topic that has been on my whiteboard for the longest time, <coughs> along with several other items. So, so thankful to finally get this in front of you so that you all can talk about it. Um, Dan was able to get some really great. Yes. Do we need to get these back to COVID? Do we need to get those back to code? Do you I'm, care? I'm fine with that. I don't care, but I'm fine to take them back if you don't want them. Yeah, or, um, yeah, some of some people mark them up. Maybe Dan, for clarity's sake, I'm going to label the watermarks with new dates and things, but I, I heard the direction was that new maps with a different scenario. Maybe it would be a different question. Or they are dated pretty clearly. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So, so Dan has gotten a lot of great information from Brad March as far as historical information about the library board, how we got here, why we're here. Um, up until a little over a year ago, we were having um, uh, the direct, the um, parks and rec manager and Ross come in and do quarterly updates. And somehow that dropped. I don't know how it got dropped off of agendas. And it just never came back. And that, in my 
in looking back at old meeting minutes of, a, of the board of trustees, that was how the library board seemed to function. It wasn't even a, it wasn't a separate call out of the library board. It was more of just a um, agenda item of an update from the library director. So, you know, we're looking, I'm, we are all, the three of us are looking for some direction about, you know, how you want to proceed as a library board. Do you want it to be the board of trustees? You're looking for something different. How often do you, are you looking at reports? How would you like that set up? So I'll turn it over to Dan to just start giving out all that information. Great. Um, libraries in Colorado are governed by the Colorado Library Law. Wellington's library is established a long time ago as the Wellington Municipal Library. Um, all libraries in Colorado are governed by a board of trustees. You know, this is in the packet. Um, but a board of trustees of a library um, has specific authority uh, as provided in the Colorado Library Law. It can, it, it oversees the library, it manages the budget of a library, it hires and fires, it's, it, it's, a, it's a governing body of a library. Um, and in the town of Wellington, um, that has traditionally been the board of trustees. Um, it, there have been times over the last 25 years, maybe a little more, that it has been um, the board of trustees have appointed members of the public to sit on that library board. But there's there's a practical issue of the board of trustees doesn't especially like to give authority to a body that it appoints to buy property, to enter into loans, or to, to take out loans, to decide its own budget, to, to buy and sell, to hire and fire. And by definition, a library board has that authority. Um, so the Board of Trustees of the Town of Wellington historically has kept that authority and has sat as the, 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 the library board itself. And should clarify one, one item that I, I get questioned, I often question, um, <coughs> certain people in the Town of Wellington, certain residences do pay taxes to the Poudre Library District. That's something you probably know or you might know. Um, the town municipal or the municipal library doesn't receive any of that funding. Uh, that's something entirely different. Uh, certain parts of town don't pay those taxes. It kind of depended on if those areas were annexed into the town before or after the Poudre Library District was formed. So if you're if you have residents who ask, why am I paying this tax to the library? Uh, oh. That's that's not what counts. That has nothing to do with town library. No control. no control whatsoever. <laughs> um, and we've the town has tried to get the Poudre Library District to stop taxing town residents because uh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Does the give us taxes? What role is that? The tenant, the property, it was part of a library district. The one that's over by the hotel, the one that we just brought into town. Well, you, if it, the, the, that one, it was outside the, the town. Mm -hmm. It was not annexed until this year, and so it was it's taxed as part of that library district. And it continues to and be. And it'll stay that way. Um, That's what the I town asked. In that. that town asked very nicely if the library district would stop taxing its residents, and they said no. And the town filed a lawsuit and said, you've got to stop taxing our residents. And the court said no. And so the town did appeal to the court of uh, Colorado Court of Appeals and said, really, we don't want to keep our residents keep paying taxes. And, Court of Appeals said no. So um, residents of town do pay that, but that has nothing to do with the town of Wellington. Um, and so that money doesn't go to But the library board itself, um, so because it has the ability to, well, it has complete authority over its own budget and, and operation of the library, that's, that, that authority's been kept with the board of trustees. And it's been somewhat informal over the years. Um, as Patty said, the library director has historically given updates to the board of trustees every so often. Um, the Board of Trustees certainly approves the budgets. Um, and in the Library Act, it says that the Library Board needs to recommend a budget and, or needs to adopt a budget. Well, the Board of Trustees adopts the budget for the library. Um, so kind of if a Board of Trustees operating in its own standard capacity has performed the functions really of that board, the Library Board. Um, there have been other times where there have been more formal meetings of the Board of Trustees as the Library Board. Um, but that hasn't happened in quite a long time, in my understanding. There are bylaws in the packet that were adopted by the library board when it was not the board of trustees, and then the board of trustees approved those bylaws. Uh, I think there's a lot of things that if the library board is to be reconstituted as a separate entity, there's a lot of things in those bylaws I'm 
highly recommend you change. Um, but kind of the, really the direction here we're looking for is what does the board want to do? Um, uh, as the library board, uh, with the library board, uh, kind of looking for, for, for guidance here. Uh, but that's a little bit of the history. I mean, it's the thing is, is as a statutory town operating a municipal library, um, the Colorado library law governs. <laughs> so um, and, the board can do what that document says. And Ross is here to provide information regarding operations and things if you're interested in hearing that. You're ready to just go on ahead and go into the discussion. That's your call. Our goal is just to try and have some information and hear what you should sell. No, I'm sorry. I just I didn't well, realize your name was I did. Did. that was I, was I, <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if you were going to catch that. Before we get started, can we just hear about some of the the, the library from Ross? What's mm -hmm. going on? Yeah. yeah. Um, so just very shortly, I am actually going to be short this time um, so that people are aware. I had surgery today, so I'm very sore and I'm not supposed to talk, so I'm going to keep it short. Um, the Wellington, even though we don't collect taxes for half the town, we manage our budget very well. We have improved and increased our numbers again this year. Um, you can see on the report the few things things I do want to point out this year, last year I decided I need, um, I'm a raw data person, um, I needed actual counts, so I took down the door counter. DPL, larger libraries use a door counter. I'm in and out of this library 45 times a day. That counts me. <laughs> so the numbers that we have this year in this report are actual patrons who actually utilized our resources. Not friends of the library, not courier, not Amazon. These are actual, we do tick marks. So our numbers dropped a bit, but these are raw data numbers um, because I needed account for accountability. I want to know exactly who's in. Um, I hope I'm making sense. I'm, I'm a little blurry, sorry. No, it's good. Um, this year, we're very proud. We all work very hard. We um, had, I provide TA reports every week. 461 new patrons. Um, I compared it to other municipalities with similar populations. I'm not gonna use names because we don't compete. We're all a team. Um, we beat them all. So uh, I was tasked with making sure that the library was successful and we are. All of our events have increased. So we're very proud and we've done it under budget. We developed a youth council this year that has been great. $8,000 donated by residents um, for youth. They get to control it, they get to manage it. We're launching programs, they have ownership. People often forget that the youth are also taxpayers. So I owe them. They spend money, they spend their allowance. I see them at Ruthie's, I see them at Dollar General. <laughs> we work for them as well. And people often forget that it's not just adults. So we're very proud. Thank you for everything you're doing. Sorry. Oh. You're fine. Okay. 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 Questions? Comments, <coughs> <coughs> so I, I can wait. So we're supposed to meet once a month, two six times a year, you know, <coughs> in three years, probably. <coughs> um, and I agree with the bylaws need to be adjusted, but I think we actually, if we're either if, if we're going to serve as a library board, we need to actually meet as a library board. Yep. If we're not going to serve as a library board, then we need to appoint a library board that can actually function as a library board. So I don't really care one way or the other, um, but when the bylaws say we're supposed to meet eight times minimum a year and we haven't met in the three years I've been on the board, mm -hmm. and who knows how long before that, that's kind of a problem. Okay. And I don't think to be the library board. I guess that's my question. I don't mind being the library board. I don't, board. Oh, we I don't have to be. I don't have to see it turn yeah. into another. We, we cannot allow a group outside. We cannot allow a group outside of this to be able to enter into contracts and loans and be in charge of the assets of the town that are not liable to electeds for one thing and are not controlled within our scope that is like the scariest thing as i was reading that who can hire and fire people um that's 
that would cause pure chaos, fear, a horrible situation. Um, and we cannot have that liability of another group managing our assets. So is that not what Dan was talking about, changing part of it? And that's mm -hmm. definitely a big part of it that mm -hmm. would need to be changed. So that, no, that's state statute. Okay. That's not something that is that state. We, can we change. cannot change that. Under the Colorado Library Law, yeah. the Library Board of Trustees has that authority. Yeah. Our by, the bylaws seem to indicate that it has less authority, but state law controls, not the bylaws of the organization. So no, um, if the, the, the town cannot create a library board that is outside we of can't make state law. Kind of a different entity that's not under that particular part. Could make a different entity, but you couldn't call it the library board. <laughs> but again, that in the process, if we did that, it could help out Ross big time, I would hope. I don't know. What would your input be on it? I don't want to make you talk anymore, but no, but no, it's fine. <laughs> um there is there is a concern with having an outside group. We do have funds, we do have trusts, we do have land purchasing dollars that were set aside decades ago. So putting temporary, it, it would, but if they could, or anything would be a temporary. Right, but you if they couldn't risk. make contracts and buy land or stuff like that, if they're there for an assistant and give you a hand. I don't think that's. Oh, I don't think that's what we're talking. I don't about. think there would be a point. I, I get what you're saying. You're saying yeah, create yeah, like yeah. just a pure, but then we'd be creating a pure advisory board, mm -hmm. That would then have to come to us as a lot. So we'd have right. in essence two. Well, that's which the only doesn't, way I could see if that. Would yeah, work. I don't think it makes sense to have two. So it's either yeah. either we Follow delegate out or, or we do it ourselves. Right. And I, I I don't have yeah. a problem with us doing it ourselves. I agree. There's a lot of concerns that were brought up previously mm -hmm. that made sense to keep it with the board. Yeah. So I I have a quick question. Do we are the bylaws required <coughs> as part of state statute? I think the, the, mm -hmm. one of the requirements is you have the bylaws. Mm -hmm. for the so, so, and the concern with the bylaws so represented are that they are in some ways far more cumbersome than what state statute requires? In some ways, they contradict state statute. In some ways, they actually say what the Board of Trustees of the town of Wellington can do. I, I think they're just not. Yeah, good bylaws. I think they should be cleaned up and, yeah. and we so, can do so that. Yeah, I mean, consensus. I guess my, my question then is like, would we want bylaws that are any more restrictive than what state statutes are? Or are we just wanting one? Just one, so, one recommendation. So, okay, go for it. Within state statute, the library board has an authority of hiring and firing. And that from the board of trustee perspective is not appropriate. So if anything, if we were to, of course, rewrite the bylaws as needed to really reference the state statute, and then maybe provide some like operational kind of things, meet quarterly, whatever, you know? Um, we need to ensure, like even through ordinance that we're delegating those hiring, reviews, bonuses, all those processes to the town administrator as we do for any other department, every other employee, because it's not appropriate for us to be doing that. Well, so. is that, if state statute says that, then that, you, you could have, you could delegate you it. Delegate. I mean, the board going to. Okay. Uh, I just want to make sure that's allowed by state statute. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Sure. I, I think in, in many regards, the bylaws are, well, they're designed for another body, but I, I think it's, they tried to restrict the, what the library board could do if it were not the board of trustees. I, I think it went a bit too far. I would, if the board of trustees is going to be the library board, I would like to rewrite the bylaws with that in mind yeah. um, and, and make it. And that's and that's what we're looking for is how does if, if that's going to be the case and that, and that would be my recommendation, how does this board want to be the library board? Do you want to meet quarterly? You can meet annually if you want. Um, I mean, we can. How do you want to exist as a library board? Do you, is the question. I would say at minimum quarterly. Yeah. I think more often than that, but minimum no less than quarterly. We were thinking we could set it up kind of how you have your liquor licensing authority, but have a separate section for the library board. <laughs> so it would be incorporated into your regular meeting. So you would have to have a separate meeting night. And like I said, do it however often you all like. We can start with quarterly. And if there's maybe we do it monthly during the summers when there's lots of activities going on or something like that. I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, that it's, almost it's, makes me think opposite because yeah. they're Ooh, summers, busy. <laughs> they're summers really busy. are really, really busy. Yeah, yeah. so you don't I'm, want to I'm do it during the busier time. I'm yeah. thinking you'd have so more to report then. Was, with the increase so in the are we as a board in agreement of being the active library yeah. board well, and then starting yeah. with meeting quarterly 
but yes, and delegating, hiring, and delegating hiring personnel matters to the town administrator. Town administrator. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if that comes to executive session for any other personnel matter that would come across the town, right. that's appropriate. Am I that, right? I'm good. Does that wrap that? Yeah. Okay. Um, I will set it up for the first um, meeting to be in July. So it'll be your second quarter. We'll finish out quarter the second quarter in June, and then we'll set it up. I'll look at agendas and see where that might fall, best fall for July. And then it'll be every three months then on the same week. So whether it's the second or the fourth meeting, it'll be consistent once we once And we, if we can have kind of bylaws be- uh, I was gonna say one of the first agenda items yeah. there yeah. would be uh, some bylaws. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> can we, can we, I don't want to miss the first one. Yeah. Okay, I have to go. And, and we'll talk. We okay. have, I haven't committed to a date. Okay. It's in July. Okay. So we'll talk. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. Golden. Then my oldest at college overseas. I can't miss it. So. No, no. We, we will, we will okay. work around your okay. schedule. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I think it's really important to acknowledge that our library is doing better than ever right now. And that's definitely due to the leadership that we have. So. And no, by no means by with the library board, do I have any intentions of inhibiting or making those processes harder or giving more workload associated with that. So I think that's really important to me to make sure that they continue in their projection. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very excited to get this going. Okay, next item is gonna be a bit of revenues and expenditures. <laughs> Good evening. Um, I think I'll just give you some high level points from the presentations and we can address any questions from there. So our general fund ended our revenues at about 83.3%. So we were below what we were expecting to receive in the general fund for 2022. Um, our sales tax collection was over what we had projected by about 20%. Um, and our property tax revenue was pretty much spot on. Um, the unexpected funds for the general fund were about $780,000. That would be due to some of the capital projects that we did not do throughout the year. Your street fund, um, we reduced the sales tax in the street fund by 50% for 2022 to allocate that to the parks fund. Um, your sales tax was still above what we projected it to be for the year. Um, your motor vehicle taxes, vehicle registration, road and bridge tax, that was all came in out of a healthy balance for the street fund and our revenue over expenditures for year to date was 135,000. I, wait, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. The so on the street fund sales tax collection year to date is six hundred and thirty thousand, which is hundred and nine percent of what we were anticipating. Thing is that all of the sales tax just to the street, just, just to the streets. Okay. Yes. That was half of a percent. Yes. So overall, we received more sales tax than like what we projected for the year. Okay. Um, your water fund revenues were just over 10 million and your water sale revenue was about 80% for the year. Um, your revenue over expenditures year to date was 2.1 million. Um, that had to do with some of the transfers. Um, we did only did 50% of the inner fund transfers for the year and we started direct billing a lot of those expenditures. Your sewer fund um, revenues was about 48 million, but I need to note that 45, 45 million of that was the loan proceeds. Um, sewer user fee revenue was about 63.1% for the year. Um, your expenditures in the sewer fund was about 122.7%, not including capital. Um, and we ended up with a year-to-date balance of about 36 million, but again, that's a lot of your loan money to go towards the capital mm -hmm. projects with expansions. So do we know, um, I know obviously we adjusted rates based on them being low for sewer, but is there a reason we're so far below what our expectation was on sewer? 
you know, I would have to research as to why that came in that way. Um, it could be partially due to non-payment of user fees. Okay. And, you know, I didn't set the budget for 2022 and what that okay. expectation okay. was. So that would be something I need to research. Okay, got it. And then do we know we were 20% over budget on expenses and operations? I mean, we could go through the year end financial report line item by line item and see where we were heavy um, on expenditures. Is our Megan or Bob online? Me, <clears throat> excuse me, both are. Okay, yeah, do you want to go ahead and promote them to a panelist? Sure. If you don't mind, maybe That'd they can answer those questions. That would be awesome. Thank so you. we can figure that out. I, I have an idea, but I, I hate to speak out of turn since okay. I'm not really deep into their budget, but let's see if they can talk about that. And I would say just a high level look at it. A lot of those line items we went over in was fuel, oil, and grease. Um, a lot of our utilities, which we saw a spike in cost of those in 2022 because of inflation. Able to get them? Um, I got Megan. Okay. Megan? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. I'm not sure. Did you see the question from Trustee? I did. Hey, would you like to field that? Um, to be honest, I I don't I don't have a clear answer for you. I do know that there were some GL corrections that I think, as of when this report was run, hadn't been um, handled to date. There was a um, close to a $40,000 correction that needed to be posted from the wastewater fund to the water fund that I believe just got just got corrected on that ledger um, in the last couple of weeks. So that that would be something. Um, but to be honest, I, I really, I would honestly need to review those line items by line items because we didn't have any projects that went over. Um, the one thing I think did go over is the sewer testing budget. Um, that one I'm aware of as we took on some additional testing related to both the selenium issues at the um, the nano from the well production that impacts our our um, permitted limits at the wastewater discharge for our discharge, um, but otherwise I, I would need to dive into it in more detail because I was not aware of any overages on specific projects that we had. So it was just a bit of a surprise to me. Yeah. So again, I'm just looking at the year end and like we're at 318 on the sewer testing percent to budget. Um, flood disposal was at 138% to budget. Professional services was 119% to budget. Water was really small, but it was 176% to budget. Utility bills were 143% to budget. RM machinery and equipment parts were 135% to budget. Yeah. Fuel oil and grease was 186%. Wages and salaries was 103%. So. I remember them discussing the equipment part of it. Didn't they have some things written down? Hang on. Are we talking about numbers on line items that are not in? They're on our year-end financial statements. That but they're on the website, not on this package. That is correct. They're okay, so website, I can, yeah. I, can we, I guess I just am wanting to stick to the information that's in the packet because I don't want to like get too far off track here. Like, because I don't have those, those numbers for a quick reference. I didn't know that that was something so I would have been better prepared myself as a trustee this evening with the line for line budget items printed out from the website if that was what I thought that we were discussing, but I thought we were discussing the treasury report here. Can I see now? Yes. I totally understand. Well, the treasury report. Is the treasury report over. is what was <clears throat> in our email for packet presentation. So I just want to clarify, I'm not allowed to ask questions about why our expenditures are over? Is no, that I, correct I, that's not what I was saying. I was just... That's what you just said. I just it's not in the packet. You can't ask the question. Trustee mm -hmm. Peter, please calm down. That's not what I said. Okay. I was just asking, is this information that is different than what's in our packet? Yes, because they did okay. not include the financial statements Great. in our That's packet. That's all I needed. It was a yes or no question. So I can tell you, Trustee Peter, that um, we have seen some of these discrepancies. It's on our leadership team meeting agenda tomorrow to go over these because Public Works has had questions because they it doesn't 
like Megan said, she's like, none of our projects went over. We're not quite sure why it's showing over budget. So we are going to be talking about this tomorrow. So we'll have more information related to the financial statements to hopefully clarify. And um, maybe if, if I'm, I'm at a little bit of a loss myself. So okay. we will we will be bringing that forward. That number I provided is for just the operation funds, not the capital mm -hmm. projects. And so we did see an increase in expenditures just because of the nature of 2022 and the increase in costs for a lot of operational items with inflation and interest rates going up and it impacted mm -hmm. everything else and it trickled down. Um, something that I would be really interested in seeing in future treasury reports, if it's possible, is the month over month and year over year sales tax collection numbers mm -hmm. so that we can see how um, the growth and development in the town is is okay. impacted. Like, because there was we had the, the COVID period, right? But we had a whole, we were like moving and popping pre COVID, mm -hmm. and we've had a bunch of things happen since then, mm -hmm. especially as we're starting to evolve with. The marijuana conversations, mm -hmm. it would be very interesting to see those trends month over month and then okay. how they compare year over year. Okay. That's really and, interesting. Um, and then one other recommendation I have is that I this is really good and detailed information, but to quickly like not super like financial, like that's not my forte. So I appreciate like where it says 119.9% of the budget, but it would be nice to have that comparison of the budgeted, the actual budget amount was $2 million mm -hmm. and then the actual. So it would be good to have the budgeted number and then the actual, and because otherwise I have to do that calculation with the, the percentage. Okay. Yeah. But lots of really good information. <laughs> I'd love to look at sales tra tax trends after we have a because it's going to really probably have impact on other businesses as well. I'm thinking, so I'm curious. Yeah, I don't yeah. think we'll be able to determine exactly that no. it came from that. We'll, we'll, well, I think we'll be able to see. Year year will be helpful in month by month and get the, especially if it's like a spike associated with that opening or whatever. So that, that would be really interesting. I agree. Well, I also think it would be really interesting to see how things like special events impact our community because I would be willing to bet that if we overlay things like some of the festivals or other things that we've had, you will see that probably those months have significant spikes. So if we're looking at trying to evaluate from an events planning standpoint, like what are the things that we want to support for a community as a whole, that nice. could help us be kind of strategic in that thinking. That's great. I love it. Any further questions on this section? No, thank you very much. Drainage. Drainage. Um, your drainage fund revenue year to date was about 730000 Your utility fee revenue was about 96% for the year, so we were close to what we budgeted. Um, expenditures for the drainage fund operation was about 25%. This is a small budget, so we don't spend a lot of money out of there. Um, we ended up with revenue over expenditures at about 328,000 for the year. With the excess in the fund balance, are we able to apply that towards capital projects in future years? In the drainage fund, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, no, no, that's what I meant, because I know that that's one of the big things is we don't have a lot of income into that, so we can apply that excess in future years to other drainage projects. Okay, thank you. Stays in the fund, that's great news. That is good news. Uh, your park fund, your total revenues year to date was about 1.5 million. <clears throat> your expenditures not including capital was about 57%. And you ended the year with revenue over expenditures at about a negative thirteen thousand dollars. So that is where your fund balances ended for each fund for twenty twenty two. So a clarification on the part. So we were budgeted to go over by even more. Is that a correct understanding? Because we were 57% of expenses, yet right. we still had a negative yes. revenue. So we really were expecting our negative. 
close to a million dollars. I would have to go back to the 2022 budget book and do some digging on that one. Um, with the park funds, I would say some of that. We started direct billing the administrative um, payroll. And so now we have accurate numbers and the overhead of what's coming out of the park fund versus what the transfers were expected to be. So mm -hmm. that could be part of why we're seeing the discrepancy in the budget. 2022 when they split public works and park from the uh, operational standpoint. Yeah, I think that was 2020. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. so it looks like the major thing in the budget was the debt service was budgeted for a million dollars and we only had 269. Didn't we pay off a purchase mm -hmm. loan early in 20? So maybe that. Mm -hmm. And that could have been it. So maybe that was, was a million. Yeah. Yeah. It was close to a million, was it not? Vic was here. So that was like, in eight, that is a difference of $800,000 yeah. in the projected expenses. So maybe that's it. Mm -hmm. it was the debt service. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. rounded out. Where are we currently at with the audit? I have. Been speaking with them yesterday, today. Um, I did reach out to her to ask for a formal update on when we will have an audit. She told me she will get back to me tomorrow and ask for more documents, which is typical of auditors where every time you reach out, they want something in return. <laughs> so I will hopefully have an answer tomorrow, is what she promised me. Are there any, any red flags or anything like that, nature? It's causing this delay or no what happens is when you engage with a new auditor they're going to go back and they're going to look at everything from every debt you have on the books to your previous audit work right. they reached out to the previous audit auditors so the first year you have a new auditor it takes so much longer because they're not familiar with your finances um, so because they're working on 21 and they're really going through everything they're trying to come to make a clear recommendation to the board, then 2022's audit work will go much faster because they have that historical knowledge of where we're standing financially. Okay. So on our end, there's no red flags or anything. anything the only anything. thing that has come up is how we've labeled the library trust fund um, because it's a restricted revenue fund and it's actually some impact fees. And I think the other impact fees and how they've been managed historically will come up. And you'll hear back from them tomorrow, hopefully? Yes. Okay. And once I hear back from them, I will send an update to Ms. Garcia that she can send to the board. Perfect. Okay, thank you. So any issues that were relative to how the, the impact fees were managed, has that been resolved? That is something we're building into the 2024 budget because we need to set up a separate fund for your park impact fees. Your groundwater dedications, your sewer impact fees, and your water impacts. On to 2023 general fund. Yeah. Um, All right, so first quarter, and this is all very fluid because we haven't had our auditor's journal entries and we're still making geo corrections and that will change what 2022 looks like. Um, Clarification. So mm -hmm. when we're looking at the 27%, that's at the whole year, whole year right? Not mm -hmm. a, okay, perfect. Just and so I was like, that's good. So, we should like to see it at about 25%. I was like, if we're at 25% of 100 for the year, we're good. If we're 27% of the 25%, we're good. Right, no. Okay, great, great. No. Okay. I do want to say I'm encouraged by the <laughs> tax collection year to date compared to the previous because the year to date for 2022 was two point about 2.5 and we're sitting at just in this first quarter we're at what one point plus total revenues sales taxes 423. 
Yeah, so we're about seven, eight percent. Oh, below. Got it. Tax. Got it. But Wrong number. That's pretty common in the first quarter because you have people coming off of the holidays. There's not a lot of money being spent. There's no traveling. So, I mean, that fluctuates. Well, and isn't sales tax collection like reported two months in the or maybe a month later or something? Like, so you, the sales tax that was collected in January isn't reported until like. February or March. Probably 20th. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, also, it depends on if they're monthly filings or quarterly. Mm -hmm. So if you have quarterly filings, that's not going to show up until April, May. And I think that's uh, to Mayor Pro Tem's point about showing the, the month to month, month over month or year to year, it, it shows that would show us are we really, are we behind? Or are we just at where we were last year? Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that makes, that helps clarify this information quite a bit. So that's a great idea. So, yeah, so I guess I like maybe to add on to that sales tax collection piece, you know, be sure and reference that it was collected in this month, but received in this month. Otherwise it'll always look like you're way behind. So what I can do for the next board packet is under staff reports, I can provide that report for you to give you clarification of where we're at with sales tax. How many years back do you think you could go on that? I was on the state website, I could probably go back several. Okay, I guess maybe like three to five years. When did they make the change to the online ordering that we got taxed? That was 2019. I wouldn't go past that yeah. because that was a big jump yeah, for us. So if we go anything deal. before that, so I would say maybe the 2019, I would not let it go past that because otherwise mm -hmm. it's going to throw It's not going to make sense. Yeah. 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 Agreed. Even COVID is going to look a little off. But yeah. at least I think having some historical data to for you to show some benchmarks yeah. or something, it would be really help us and help us as we start talking yeah. about economic development, things like that. So we have something yeah. to base our progress on. I'd be curious to see 2018 forward, and then we can scrap that column if we see that those numbers are like super off. That would be yeah. in five years. Well, we would have a good like milestone there to mm -hmm. show. Yeah. yeah. Look at the increase. I can provide that there. for the next board Passage. packet, and that way you guys have that data when we start going into budget discussions and presentations. And That'd be perfect. All right, your street fund, your sales tax revenue is below in the street fund again, but I think it's part of previous discussion. Your expenditures in the street fund right now are only about 10.6%, so we are below, um, but that is variable and it's still early in the year. Yeah. Is that CFP2 or is that just operational? Operational. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. That's what I'm thinking. It, it's, yeah. Yeah. it's really yeah. early in the year and a lot of the capital expenditures may not have started, especially if we have contracts involved. So I didn't yeah. implement that on this report. I was going to wait until the mm -hmm. quarter two. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sorry. I have one more question regarding the revenues piece. Mm -hmm. I know that property tax revenue for the town is very insignificant. However, with the recent changes to the assess rates and things, it, I would be curious to know what the impact is to our community relative to that as well. Okay. When would that be visible? Would that not be till next um, year? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it'd be good to collect the data from this year to yeah. see what that, because a lot of communities are talking about like 30 to 45% increases. Mm -hmm. I can imagine that. So it, that it would just be quick discussion. interesting to see mm -hmm. that that data. Yes. Sorry. And and that's going to be reflected this year, and then they'll be assessed, and then that's collected. So, but it'd be good to have just kind of mm -hmm. see. Sorry. No, it's okay. There. I know it's request. So in your water fund, your water sales revenue is at about 19.2%. I think the big thing to note here is that the rate increase happened in February. So um, we're still tracking to see where we're sitting with our water sales revenue and how that's going to be effective. Also, the summer rates are going to be where we really see the jump in revenue. And the usage too. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're not bad considering 
<laughs> not me this summer. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm not contributing to that fund this year. <laughs> and we're still tracking well below expected expenditures. Um, your sewer user fee is at about 15% for the year. So again, we're gonna watch that and see how this looks mid-year. And your uh, operational expenditures is at 18%, so it's still below where we're at for the year. Um, your drainage fund utility fee revenue is at 25.2%, so we're right on par where we need to be. And your operational expenditures are at about 8% for the year. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, okay, that makes sense then. Yep. <laughs> that one's the consistent. Yeah. Um, your park fund, same thing. You're about 17.2% with your sales tax revenue, and your expenditures are at 17.6%. So we're still tracking below expenditures in that fund. Um, Any more questions? I, all of our revenue just comes from that portion of sales tax. I get it to tax. Mm -hmm. Where does that store in like real estate revenue? Uh, rent? Yeah. Rent? They have, we, we have recreation user fees. Um, there is also park facilities. You know, while she's looking that up, Trustee Gator, I'm totally open to going over like a line by line of all of the accounts with your state to actual budget. I guess I would just request that we just have all of that information prepared and are ready to go in advance. I, I did ask for that information and I was told to go to the town website and look it up. Mm -hmm. I requested that information. I was told it's already publicly available, so just go look it up. So I did. That's so, why I, I did ask the question a couple of days ago. And I was informed, hey, this information, which I think is good, it's made publicly available so our residents don't have to wait for a board packet. They can literally go to the finance website and it's all right there, which is great. So that's where I went to it. So um, I guess, what would it, I think what would be helpful for me as a trustee is what set a standard for what the expectation is of the reporting in the treasurer's report? Like, do we wanna do a deep dive into the line items or are we looking for just this overview of the funds? Because I'm, I'm definitely up for doing that. I just want to make sure that I'm like properly prepared mm -hmm. and ready to have the conversation. So I think that, you know, so that we're having consistent information to review month over month or quarter over quarter, year over year, maybe setting a standard for what the expectation is of the treasurer's report. I am totally fine with an overview, but when there are things that jump out, like a fund being severely under on revenue and severely 20% over on expenditures for the year, I would hope as elected officials, we would have some questions about what is going on here. And if it's a matter of reporting, that's fine. Let's fix it. If it's a matter of, hey, we, you know, maybe we overextended ourselves in some areas, we need to address that. That's part of our financial responsibility. So when there's things, if they're all in line with what I expect, I don't necessarily feel I need to go in there. But when I see something where it's like, hey, we're 20% over budget for the year, you know, maybe a 20% in the first quarter, let's keep an eye on it, but 20% at the end of the year, that should trigger some questions. So when those things come up, absolutely. You now, if everything's online and on board, there may not need to so go into the detail. Would it be fair to maybe request that if there's a specific category that is showing that the year-to-date percentage is trending to go over budget, that they could maybe that's like a trigger for staff to know that they need to provide a little bit more detailed information I, I, on I that think category? that would be very wise, yes. Okay. And that yes, yeah, so and now that we've got some, hopefully we'll have some good data moving forward. Especially in 2024, I think the information we're getting, what we're doing in 2023 is pretty solid. Um, but we do, we we see the discrepancies in 2022. I talked to Public Works for a long time today about what I was seeing based on you asked for the information and Jerry copied me on it. I'm like, oh my, I guess I didn't realize this was on here. Let us take a look, see. And I started looking. I hopped over there, and they're like, "Oh my God, this doesn't make sense." So they're kind of going through their data. Like I said, we're talking about it as a leadership team yeah. tomorrow to start going through it. I will report back to all of you okay, um, cool. because it is it's it's disconcerting. Yeah, and so. this comes this all comes back to what we have on our strategic plan. 
the letter that came back from the finance committee earlier this year of we need to have good financial controls. And that has been something that's been a concern with the audit is like, you know, how money was being transferred here and there. And that was a practice for a long time. But that's not a good practice because there were not good financial controls. And that is part of that is when we, that's again, the buck stops with us, right? It, it doesn't stop with charity. It doesn't stop with Patty. It ultimately stops with us because we are the ones who are accountable to the residents who pay taxes to the town to make sure that we have good controls put in place over our finances. And so there needs to be, when we see something that is off, that's why the treasurer's report is important, making sure that we have accurate information, departments are providing information, we have our audits so that we know that's part of the point of an audit. I'm excited to get it back is say, where are the areas that we need to make improvements so that we can do that? But then it is on us that when we see something that's not right, we need to ask those questions and get answers. It doesn't mean that there's anything bad necessarily, but we need to know there's a gap somewhere and we need to figure out where the gap is. Is it in reporting? Is it in, we spent money we didn't realize that we'd spent? That happens to me in my own personal budget. So it's not that I expect other people to not be like me, but our job is to make sure, okay, we don't continue that process. And so I think that this comes down under that, again, transparency and are we being wise with how we spend our finances? Mm -hmm. Is it's paying attention to things like this and then asking the questions and staff job to then provide, go and find the answers and then provide us with those answers. So moving forward in the reports, if we see something like this, can you provide this information and have a breakdown for us so we can discuss it afterwards? I think that flag is awesome to have in general. Um, and it's my understanding from the takeaway from this is you guys are just as surprised on this as we are coming into this situation. So there was a lot of questions through a lot of departments, even us as trustees. So, uh, yeah, it's, and as Charity's putting information together and, and things, it, it, it is, there is a lag. There's been a lag and we knew that. And now we're starting, now that we're like staffed and things, we, mm -hmm. we are starting to be able to go back and start looking at some of these things that we should have been looking at, you know, six months ago. So now we're like, oh my goodness, we need to figure out what happened because like I said, public works, like we didn't go over budget on any project. How did this happen? Mm -hmm. Did something get miscoded or something mm -hmm. like that? So that's what I'm guessing. Um, I, I, so I would also go say, from there. I think, um, you know, when I got here in June, halfway through the year 2022, none of 2022 had been reconciled. And so your leadership team was not given those financial statements that you have up on the website. So they could see where they're at in their line items and mm -hmm. say, hey, we're going to go over. We need to maybe make some adjustments or we need to make this communicated to the town administrator. And so now that we have the availability to provide them these reports on a monthly basis, we can have those conversations and we can start monitoring these funds and these expenditures. So we can be more proactive in terms of communicating to you on how we are managing the money. Mm -hmm. So do you feel like you're like, that's a long time, like to have to go back six months and get that caught up. And then no, we were trying, we were trying to yeah. and trying to stay on top of what you have going on. <laughs> Where you're at today, do you feel like you are caught up or do you feel like there is still a lack? I think we have a few quirks we're dealing with, but it's not the lag that it was when I got here to the point where it would inhibit our leadership team to monitor their finances on a monthly basis. Uh, and because we don't have that, it's done. I don't know what the 2021 and 2022 AJEs are going to do and how they're going to change these reports. Um, so we have to be mindful of that. I don't foresee a whole lot of changes being done because of the way we got things reconciled, but that's always a possibility. When you say quirks, can you expand on that? Quirks as in... Um, internal processes of making sure that things are getting coded and we have data correct the first time. Um, you know, going back and changing geo codes is a pretty tedious process because we have to delete all of the original checks and then reissue them with the proper geo codes. And that's just how Cassell is. So making sure that now that we're fully staffed, being on top of all of those financial procedures so we don't have to go back and make as many changes. Um, that's the kind of quirks I'm talking about. Okay. So 
out of curiosity, how do you memorialize those financial procedures? Well, now that I have staff, we're going to start working on internal policies and SOPs. And, you know, there's been a lot of meetings with other departments on how we can implement better procedures to make things more efficient. Do you feel like with the procedures that are currently in place or that have been in place, that there were enough checks and balances with staff internally? Or where do you see there could be improvement on that? I think anytime you come into an organization, there's room for growth and just learning how to address that. And again, being short staffed was a challenge. Um, and that's nothing in our control. Um, so I think just starting fresh from this point forward and being able to implement those processes will help all of our leadership. So sometimes in the audits, they look at those procedures and make recommendations. Mm -hmm. Are there any recommendations from prior years that are haven't been followed or that need to be implemented currently? I would say yes. Okay. I think when you are dealing with a high turnover rate, especially with some front facing staff, that presents some process challenge. Um, so now that we have a stable front office, that's our starting ground to build up. So I mean, if there's an area that we were lacking or that we weren't doing well, I think it's okay to, to admit and acknowledge that and then acknowledge what we're going to do to rectify it moving forward. Mm -hmm. I mean, would you agree? Yes. Is there anything that you want to acknowledge that we should know about, like that we as trustees can do to help improve on those processes or provide additional controls? I mean, we have the finance committee that is providing some additional oversight. Um, we've been pretty open about providing like some feedback on what we want to see in reporting and things. Like, are there any other recommendations you would have? I think um, just for best practice purposes, we might want to implement a key card policy. Um, I think just some internal memorialized cash handling policies would be a good idea. Um, you know, I thought we had that already. Um, Stephanie says we have one. Cash handling policy? I'm sorry. Okay, never mind. I'm sorry. I just, I just spoke at a turn. I apologize. I don't okay. have any questions. Sounds like it's a system being built on. Yep, there is a lot and going on. We got a new person here, and she's developing her own ways. And uh, sounds like it's going the right way. So appreciate you. Yeah, there's been you know a lot of turnover. It's a difficult mm -hmm. position, and I'm sure that trying to carry that torch hasn't been easy. Absolutely. She's she's been working hard. Yeah. No doubt about that. Working mm -hmm. hard. I'm extremely grateful that every time I have a question, you can answer my question. So, and that is one of those things where when you walk through and have someone explain it to me in terms that a financial person understands compared to you explain it to me in a term <coughs> that I'm going to understand as someone who does not deal with books and does not understand a lot of this stuff or look at it on a regular basis, other than when we are in our trustee meetings. Um, I feel like you possibly got put on the spot this right. evening. I'm grateful for the honesty and answers, um, but I would love to see if there is things that we need to be doing moving forward. Um, right? Yeah. yeah. Like at the end of the day, if there is uh, <clears throat> anything. Right. We're here to help you. Absolutely. And uh, anything we can do. Yes. Yeah. And as I said, at the end of the day, it's our responsibility. So, and I think that 
it was the policy of the last board. We had to deal with water rates and a bunch of other stuff that mm -hmm. was really ugly, but we dealt with what had to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I think it's the same with this board. I don't think any of us have an interest in continuing to see mistakes of the past continued in. So especially as we get the audit back, if there are things that need to be adjusted or changed, um, I continue to come back to one of our priorities on our strategic plan is the financial, how we're handling our finances. That's like a big deal. We want to make sure we're getting that right. So as we're going through things, I think that's an important part of the process is just letting us know, working with the staff to implement policies internally. If there are things that need to be adjusted there, if there are things that need to be adjusted at a board standpoint where we need to work on an area, you know, we, we have to know. I appreciate, you know, being able to look on the website and see March's data. Mm -hmm. I know a big thing last year was, you know, I got to June and I had no information from since January. So we're trying to make decisions on budget and we have no idea what we've spent up to that point. So it's great that, you know, here I am in May and I've already got the completed March numbers that I can look back a month. So that's been huge progress from where we're at. Looking forward to getting our audit back and hopefully we'll actually get some feedback from the audit to say if there are areas that they identified that maybe we don't, we don't see that we need to improve. So I appreciate the work that you're doing. Yeah. It just seems Patty's a lot less stressed with you in your position. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I'm, I'm grateful for yes. you because she smiles a lot more when we talk right. about finances. So, and even with the coat, too. Yep. Right. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just having, 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 having a full team has been amazing. Mm -hmm. It has been amazing. We've had our hiccups, but we're, we're working through them. You know, one other thing that I'd be curious to see is what we're able to do on our aging accounts for the utilities like if we're able to make progress with that with the changes that you've made through the policy or the you know if you're we just talked about days that. late you so know, oh. what that if we're able to lower that <laughs> deficit of 120 plus days 90 days 60 days i would say that we found a really special employee in our utility bill coordinator um, yes he has the perfect personality for the job and his experience coming from being a car salesman to now doing utility billing is not going to happen. It's working really he's well. Not okay. a, he's not afraid to get on the phone. Mm -hmm. And so I've given Next him a time. lot of projects that kind of piled up in the chaos. And he is calling people. He's being extremely proactive. He's seeing that there's an account balance and it's a landlord account. And he's calling them and says, hey, you have a balance on here. Who's responsible for it? Um, and so it's really great to see not only somebody in that role that can be very analytical with the data, but also has the outgoing personality to not be afraid to pick up the phone and call people. Um, Get the gap. And, and Stephanie worked really hard in that position because she was very analytical and we were able to identify a lot of data issues in Cassell. Um, and anyone who works in Cassell knows that if you put bad data in, you're going to have bad data out. And so being able to just clean out module by module. Um, and she was able to do that with the utility billing. So she handed him a pretty clean product that was working much better than it was for her when she started. Um, and so he doesn't have the time of trying to figure out the file path issues and the Cassell quirks that he can focus on the customer service piece. Mm -hmm. Awesome. It's interesting how um, when somebody calls to yell at you about a utility bill and when a man answers the phone, how they they just respond differently. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just do. It's and, and that was a really good hire on your part. A really good hire. Um, I can, I want to give you a quick update. I went to a uh, um, LCSO meeting on the SRO, um, how, how things are going this year, things like that. Um, they feel, they feel very good about where they're ending up this year with the one SRO. Um, they have not, as of the meeting today, they said they would not be asking for another SRO, but they might change their mind by the time it comes around time for budget. They will have an additional additional 198 students there next year when they're bringing in the next grade mm -hmm. up. Um, but feel they feel there were some really good lessons learned this year. So I know we had talked about that this that this presentation was going to potentially morph into talking about you know LCSO mm -hmm. and SROs and things like that. So I wanted to let you know that. Um, 
we have also, today we also met with the Wellington Senior Resource Center. Um, their grant funding is short. Um, the grants, the grant funding that they received from Larimer County is about half of what they expected. I mean, that's happening across the board. Um, most of the money from the grants is going towards nutrition as opposed to transportation. Um, I told them that one of the items, one of the goals for the Board of Trustees was to have a joint work session with the senior group. I told them I'd get that scheduled um, before budget season. They let us know how much money they're needing. Kelly will actively start searching for grants. She's asked for their grant, grant contract so we know kind of what they're, how it all looked. And so Kelly will start looking for some grant documents. But um, I told them that the Board of Trustees, I hope I don't, I did not speak out of turn, but I said the Board of Trustees really support this, this group and want to make sure you're successful. So we will find a way to make it work. Um, so um, we'll prepare them with some talking points and data, hopefully, you know, as opposed to just, you need some money. Um, so we'll, we'll hopefully come prepared um, at that point in time. So I'm looking probably at August, maybe um, depending on how agendas look in July, perhaps it's a work session after a regular meeting if there's a short, if there's a short agenda. Um, so I wanted to get you updated on that. So there will be an ask for somebody. They are funded through February of 2024. So we, this will work well in the budget cycle. Mm -hmm. Wanted to let you all know that. That just happened today, so both of those items. Anything else budget related questions, comments? Nothing for budget, no. On to our thing calendar. Yep, it's that is just a document. Um, I like to have that information in there. That's for the public. That's for you all, just so that you people have an idea of those topics you guys will be talking about over the next couple months. Um, on the second page, it talks about um, other activities that you might be attending. Um, CMLs listed on there, which of course we'll post and publish um, or post um, on our uh, on the website and the town hall. Um, so yeah, that's just information for you all and. It, it does change. Nothing set in stone. We are mm -hmm. sad. I wish I, Ethan's working really hard to make us plan better. So, well, <laughs> I love the early packets. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he, I will admit to it, like an additional day of procrastination since I did get that yeah. packet early. That's, so, but yeah. I love seeing it come in early when I have available time. I can. Yep. That sit is, and read it. So that's a, I'm appreciative of that. It's certainly not just me too. It's right. definitely the whole leadership <laughs> getting on board with it, which is great. So he, he's the one that's come up with some ideas and wants to make sure to get things to you a little bit earlier and help us try to plan out um, further so, uh, so we're not making changes um, that much, which will be really helpful. Um, we're going to get the packet out Thursday this week. We've also placed it down. So talking about posting meetings and things we did, we have put on the outside of town hall a display board where we will be posting um, agendas outside like we had a pretty old town hall. So Ooh. that's something <clears> new we just got installed today. There's one thing I had a request on before we go. Sorry, guys. Um, in talking to one of the planning commissioners in a casual conversation, is there a way to set up planning commissioner emails where they can receive the emails directly that they're looking at and reviewing? So when someone's airing a grievance or wants to comment on anything, is there a way that they can also receive in the moment emails where they're not getting a packet full of 120 pages of comments that they're like as opposed to going it going to their personal email would just go it to, goes like, so you guys, everything like is screened so and that way if they have something they're going to be hearing patty you know that you can go in and shut do our responses saying mm -hmm. They received your email but cannot respond on this information. Blah blah blah. Is there a way to set that up for them? Look into that. I just made myself a note. Let me ask. Got it. Yeah, I've I've seen that in other municipalities, not but so I am included on your email as like the staff person, mm -hmm. and I don't know if 
adding Cody to a planning commission, even though he already gets a gazillion right. by adding, uh, but it might be nice, especially, it might be nice for them to have a separate email. I can look into the cost and see how that might look. Um, but in most municipalities, it, there is what the board of the elected officials and planning commission generally have separate emails. Got it. Awesome. We'll take a look. Thank you for the idea. I will report back. Yep. Another for the uh, this is wanted to put this out. So if we can post this, so uh, the Betty got the group together on May 22nd. That's a Monday at 6:30 at the Boys and Girls Club. Um, so did want to. I will be going. Um, wanted to extend an invitation to Mayor and Patty, but also if any of the other trustees would like to just come and hear from the members of the Hispanic community, they are getting the group back together on the 22nd at 6.30 at the Boys and Girls Club. I'll set that a calendar in okay. Thank you. Well, yes, yeah, so I'm like, wait. Also at the Boys and Girls Club is the um, school-based healthcare um, discussion to review some very alarming uh, survey results from our students and parents. Um, and uh, Kind of the overall support for a school-based health system out of Wellington Middle High School. So if you want to learn more about that, what they're what they actually will do, um, what the concerns were, or how much it's planning on being utilized based on surveys, um, June sixth, Boys and Girls Club, five thirty, and Boys and Girls Club. Does anybody want me to add that as an invite? No. I will not be here. Okay. I won't worry about that one. I will do the boys and girls. I will do the Betty. <coughs> the Betty. The Betty. <laughs> Sorry. It's getting late. I'm getting hungry. After all, we've been here later. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I know this. I know this discussion was a little tense tonight. Sometimes, but this is what this is what you guys do. You're doing a good job. Okay.